But we are not in a corn economy where banks serve as an intermediary between farmers who have excess seed and farmers who want more seed. Uh, we are in a, a model, um, an economy where banks actually create credit, and uh, that uh, uh, that makes again a very big difference. Your article focuses on broad money. What determines how much of that there is? Well, broad money, which in many ways is a better measure of the amount of money circulating in the economy, includes all the bank deposits of households and companies. And one of the key points of the article is that banks create additional broad money whenever they make a loan. Now, while this is nothing new, it is sometimes overlooked as the main way in which money is created. And it runs contrary to the view sometimes put forward that banks can only lend out deposits that they already have. In fact, loans create deposits, not the other way around. So, some key insights on banks. The key function of banks is money creation, not intermediation. And if you t tell that to a mainstream economist, that's already provocative. But it is 100% correct. Okay? What banks do, and I was a banker at Barclays Bank for five years. I made loans. I know exactly what the entries are that you need to create when you make a loan. Uh, it, it's you, you create uh, a new loan uh, on the asset side of the balance sheet. And when you do that, you uh, create a new deposit of exactly the same amount um, that is credited to the guy who has just borrowed from you. So in terms of causation, the critical issue here is that loans come before deposits. Loans create deposits, uh, and not vice versa. What the intermediation story misses completely is the monetary nature of financing. So the bank just provides check clearing services so that people can exchange the money that has been created among themselves for their business needs. The actual purposeful activity of the bank has been the creation of new money. And of course, it can also destroy money. This story happens every single time a bank makes a loan. And it is completely different from the loanable fund story. The implications is that no lo uh, new loans involve no intermediation, no funds are being withdrawn from previous users as savings. And that means, and that is absolutely critical, and for Irving Fisher it was front and center, is that banks can easily start a lending boom. Because if they can do this, they can simply grow their balance sheet by expanding the money supply. The broad money supply, that is, of course, not the narrow money supply. Okay? They do not have to attract deposits of pre-existing money. But while that inner guts of the system, the web of contracts, is important, the even more important driver of financial instability is simply rising leverage of a particular form, and a particular form on which finance theory and macroeconomics has been entirely silent, or mainly silent, or to the extent that not silent, it has been wrong. If you pick up most undergraduate textbooks, and we were talking earlier this morning about the role of what we have to do in teaching undergraduates and graduate economics, and you ask, you see how they describe the role of the banking system, they make two mistakes. First of all, they describe a system which takes money from savers and lends it to borrowers, failing to realize that the banking system creates credit, money, and purchasing power ab initio, de novo, and with an important role, therefore, within the economy. But also, again and again, it says, well, what banks do is they take deposits from households, and they lend money to businesses, making, as Joe referred to earlier, the capital allocation process between alternative capital investments. As a description of what modern advanced economy banking systems does, this is completely mythological. Michael, uh, welcome to Silver Age. Uh, uh, you wrote an article in uh, Fréttablaðið uh, uh, yesterday, you said that Iceland was under attack. Is Iceland under attack, and by whom? Well, it's under financial attack, not military attack. And the objective is exactly the same. The objective is to get control of uh, your resources, your natural resources, your money, and it's as if uh, paying foreign debt is very much like paying foreign tribute. 
uh, but without the cost of a military overhead or an occupation. Uh, the difference is that a country may not realize it's under attack. It may think it's at peace. It may think this is the normal way of doing business. Mm -hmm. But what's happened to Iceland in the last 10 years is not the normal way of doing business at all. And uh, f uh, the European community and international banks have acted in a, a predatory way towards Iceland. They have uh, tried to extract as much revenue as they can, and they found out that doing it financially is the easiest way to get control of a country, uh, much easier than uh, the cost of military invasion, in which case people really fight back. But Iceland ha hasn't been fighting back uh, against the financial attack. But you say that Iceland should fight back. Well, I think it's right for any country to mm. get control of its resources. Uh -huh. No country should uh, let itself essentially uh, be looted. Every country should try to use the financial system to grow and to raise the living standards. Mm. And instead, there's no way that living standards can rise now. Uh, there's no way that uh, uh, Iceland can go forward when it has to pay this heavy tribute uh, of interest and uh, debts that are way, way beyond its ability to pay. So in your view, what, what happened in Iceland in the last years? They fell for a, they believed that neoliberal uh, economics, which is really pro-financial economics, they believed that the way to get rich was to run into debt. Mm -hmm. And no country in history has ever believed that. Everyone's always tried to stay out of debt, and Iceland thought that if it, it could uh, uh, borrow and run into debt and somehow hope that uh, it could use this to invest in uh, prices, that, assets that would go up in price, mm -hmm. it would come out ahead. And so it, it bet the, uh, the whole country. And any uh, textbook on how to manage an economy or how to manage a company uh, starts. The very first rule is never take a risk that puts the whole company uh, uh -huh. at, at risk of loss. And uh, they took a risk that violates every economic uh, textbook. And who did this? Uh, I don't know because I'm not here in Iceland. Obviously, uh, the Icelandic bankers did. Uh, the people in charge of uh, committing Iceland to pay foreign debts uh, made the decision uh, to pay without any calculation of how they were ever going to pay. I don't believe that anyone could have looked at Iceland's situation and said, uh, if things go wrong, uh, here's how we're going to pay. We're going to have to sell off all of our natural resources. Half the uh, homeowners are going to have to lose their homes. Uh -huh. And uh, the creditors are going to have to end up with all the assets, and we lose everything. I don't think anybody made that calculation. No. But you sh do you think that Iceland should not pay its debts? I don't think they should be paid, mm. but the, uh, you, the starting point is that uh -huh. they can't be paid. There's simply no way that these debts can be paid off. Uh, and so the question is, how are they not going to be paid? Mm -hmm. And there are two ways. Either uh, they can stretch out, they can fail to realize they can't be paid. Uh -huh. You'll stretch uh, it out as long as possible, which is what the creditors want, until mm -hmm. you've already sold off your natural resources, yeah. you've already uh, privatized your public domain and sold it off, you've already foreclosed on homes, and then at the very end the, of losing everything, then you realize you mm -hmm. can't pay. Mm -hmm. Or, at the very beginning, you make a calculation and say to the creditors who owe your money, tell us how we're supposed to pay uh, under the normal course of doing mm. business. Uh, and it'll be very clear uh, that they can't pay. Now, the creditors uh, are trying to pressure Iceland very quickly. Mm. They, they're, they're like a high-pressure salesman. Yes. They're saying, make a decision quickly uh -huh. that you're going to pay us, and then they stretch it out. So they're, they're saying, make it quickly before you calculate how much you owe, before you calculate what the cost of paying will be, and most of all, before you ask the banks whether they've behaved mm -hmm. in a crooked, uh, uh, immoral, and actually illegal way. But it's, you said that, that we, the system is a paradise for the creditors. It's, uh, for the short term it is. You know, it, uh, it, it, is it, favors they, the, it favors the creditors. Well, and that's what's unique about Iceland. Mm. Usually in every business cycle, there's a build-up and then there's a crash. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of the crash is it wipes out the bad debts. Mm -hmm. And the business upswing can take place once the economy is free of debts. But in this case, Iceland is not being free of debts. And in fact, uh, it can't even inflate its way out of debt mm -hmm. uh, because you have uh, the debts indexed to the rate of inflation, but not wages. So th there's a, a debt squeeze. And that's called debt deflation. The whole, uh, the normal circular flow between production and consumption is being interrupted mm. by creditors taking out, extracting so much money that the economy shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. 
And that's why the debts can't be paid. Shrinking doesn't help you pay the debts. It makes you even more dependent. Uh, so the, I am, the kind of austerity mm -hmm. program that the International Monetary Fund is telling Iceland to do to pay won't work. It's going to make things worse and worse. If it's so not. the IMF is giving us the wrong advice. They, that's their job. That's what they've been doing for the last 50 years. But they're the basically round. running the country. No. What? They are basically running the country. Now. Yes, uh, P that's because they believe in a free market. And a free market believes in centralized planning, total control, mm -hmm. uh, but not by democratically elected people. The planning it moves out of the hands of democratically elected government into the hands of uh, uh, bankers, mainly foreign bankers. So the government, in effect, has been turned over to the foreign bankers to run Iceland for their benefit, not for the benefit of the people. Mm -hmm. And that goes against every democratic tradition of Western Europe. Should we kick out the IMF then? Uh, not, uh, not only kick it out, mm -hmm. but I'd say withdraw from it. Look at what they've done to Latin America. Look at the history of what they've done to every single country. In 1973, many New Zealanders watched with concern as Chile's new military dictatorship imposed wide-ranging social and economic changes. Queremos dar la confianza al mundo entero para abrir las puertas a capitales extranjeros que se deseen establecer en este país. All opposition was crushed as state-owned corporations were sold off. Multinationals took over most of the country's natural resources. Welfare and education spending was cut. Hospitals were privatized. Ten years later, no armed force was needed when a democratically elected government began a similar program of change in New Zealand. During the 1970s, the multinational share of world economic activity increased rapidly. The investor gives you his money to use so long as you give him a return, uh, which uh, uh, is greater, greater than the original, that's it. So you have to grow, you can't stand still. Profits and expansion were hindered in many parts of the world by laws regulating markets and protecting domestic business from foreign competition. In New Zealand, multinationals were frustrated by the protectionist policies that Labour and national governments had introduced over 40 years. In 1983, the Labour caucus elected David Longy as new leader. I am not an economist, am proud to assert that I'm not an economist, and can use them in so far as they can be used. Although I remember there's a chap called Stalin once that shot them. Now, I don't intend to emulate that, but I tell you that I am not going to worship at the altar of pretending to be an economist. He selected his friend, Roger Douglas, to be Labour's finance spokesperson. The Treasury economists began writing a brief for the man they hoped would become their new boss, Roger Douglas. But this was no ordinary brief for an incoming minister. It was a comprehensive prescription for transforming the New Zealand economy. Corporate tax rates reduced to attract overseas investment, real wages cut, controls on foreign exchange transactions abolished, tariff and export incentives dropped. Where possible, 
stopped government activities to be commercialized or sold. Welfare spending targeted and reduced. The National Party continued to decline in the polls. The last of a number of official reports critical of Muldoon's handling of the economy was leaked three days before the election. I know the New Zealand economy better than any other living soul. In or out of the state services, in or out of politics, parliament, anywhere else. I've lived with it intimately for 20 years, 20 years. And I know what we're doing. I know where we're going. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. And we're winning. And we're winning. Behind me, we have a Prime Minister. Theoretically, I should have been very pleased. I must admit to very mixed feelings on the night of the election, and I guess I must have had some sixth sense that things were going to happen that weren't going to be all good, but not in my wildest dreams on that election night did I believe they'd be as bad as they subsequently became. Taken in isolation, the major effect of devaluation will be to increase prices. Taken in isolation, the major effect of lifting interest rate controls will be to increase interest rates. Taken in isolation, a major effect of the reduction in export incentives will be to reduce the profitability of exporters. Taken together, however, these moves will improve the competitiveness of our products, help to increase employment, reduce the government deficit, and so help reduce inflation and reduce interest rates. It is far better that we start adjusting to changes voluntarily than to have it forced upon us. I believe that uh, we can introduce into New Zealand competent economic management and I believe that if we do introduce competent economic management, which is going to take a couple of years to show the benefits, then New Zealand can climb back to being one of the richest countries in the world and where everyone could expect an increase in their standard of living. Uh, Over the next few months, economists with different views tried to debate the issues and the Treasury solutions to them but they were outmaneuvered and outgunned. And it doesn't matter how you measure it, it comes up with the fact, as the Minister said, we've been living beyond our means for 10 years. This has produced some horrible problems which we have tried to solve by direct intervention in the economy, the command economy. It's failed and now we are back trying something else. And hopefully we'll try a market economy. Corporatisation produced massive redundancies. Thousands of New Zealanders lost their jobs. What about our families? Rogernomics was hitting most sectors. Farmers and provincial towns were badly affected. What I was saying was that I thought it would be a pity if in the situation of the present downturn, this led to increased pressures on government to try and provide relief to certain sectors. But if you're going to take a stand, shouldn't you become a politician? No, no, because I haven't entered the political arena. I haven't uh, told the government what they should do. I have merely expressed an opinion. Which is support of government policies. Uh, indeed. <clears throat> Across the road, Treasury and Reserve Bank officials were encouraging every possible expression of support for Roger Douglas and his reforms. If big business were more politically active, Cabinet's resolve would be strengthened. Economist Roger Kerr resigned his job at Treasury to become Executive Director of the low-profile Business Round Table. Uh, the ideology was developed by Treasury that didn't um, really traditionally carry out public debate. It was still uh, keeping the facade of a traditional public service even though it was much more active and was actually a political department by this time. Uh, but what Kerr arrival at the round table did was it allowed the new right to have a public face. New Zealand has adopted a package of economic structural changes and reforms 
that increasingly means the rigid structures that we have got to work with within the labour uh, movement are just totally inappropriate to today's and uh, in fact are not serving not only business but are not serving the interests of workers uh, as well. Time will prove that if we're to get the growth in the economy and the benefit from some of the very good economic changes of the last three years then the labour market will need to be restructured more along the lines that we have advocated. The asset sales would proceed regardless of public opinion. The national airline would be sold to a consortium including its competitors Japan and Qantas Airlines. Also on the block were the Maui platform and natural gas reserves and distribution network, the petrochemical fertilizer and methanol plants, the public share of the oil refinery and oil reserves and the Motunui natural gas to synthetic petrol plant which meets 30% of our petrol needs. All would be sold to the New Zealand based multinational Fletcher Challenge. Over half of New Zealand's banking and insurance sector was publicly owned. All these companies would be sold to their Australian and British competitors and Fay Richwhite and Fletcher Challenge. The New Zealand shipping line, established by the third Labour government, would be sold to its European competitor, Associated Container Transport. New Zealand steel and the country's iron sand resources ended up in the hands of its giant Australian competitor, BHP. There were few constraints on other foreign investors. We like to know what's happening, so we run an approval system, but we seldom turn people down. Uh, and these days especially we're keen that people should come in from overseas and set up here. So anything that can be done from the government's point of view will be done to encourage that. I just want to salute you for a great contribution to New Zealand, for a great contribution in fact to the world political stage because you are recognised and known as a leader internationally who has done some exciting things for this country. And I think that's just something that we should all say thank you for. And uh, my friend, I'm sorry to see you go. Can I turn to Jeffrey? I've changed my mind. <laughs> New Prime Minister Jeffrey Palmer kept Roger Douglas out of economic policy. But with little chance of re-election, the government continued to implement the new right agenda. Richard Preble was reappointed and told to sell more state assets. Uh, we're here today to announce the sale of Telecom Corporation of New Zealand and to introduce the partners who will be guiding the company in the future. The sale to an American-led consortium was opposed by 96% of New Zealanders. Promises safeguarding the community's interests were engraved in stone tablets made of plastic. I'd like to thank the Treasury and the advisors to Treasury, Barbara Wilson and CS First Boston. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you National's economic vision. This really is a very proud day for the National Party, and we're just so thrilled that so many of you have made it your business to travel to be here today. A general election was due in November 1990. The National Party knew it could win. The checkbooks are always open for a political party, so long as they get the, uh, you know, get the things right. You know. They were looking for somebody who had a, an agenda, a plan, an ideology, and um, of, of a pretty talentless caucus between 1987 and 1990 there was really only one person on the economic front who had that agenda and that was Ruth, Ruth Richardson and, um, and she basically made her ideology the parties principally because she faced no opposition Ruth Richardson had the help of two economists Martin Haynes from the National Bank and Ian Rennie from Treasury uh, There's no question that uh, the, the paid advisers that were put into the opposition, one by Treasury uh, and the other by the commercial community had a significant influence um, in, uh, if you like, fleshing out the ideology of Ruth Richardson and turning it into practical policies that could be implemented uh, if national gained power. National began the 1990 election campaign with the slogan, Creating a Decent Society, 
and presented itself as defending the New Zealand way of life. What about your overtime rates, your penal rates? Good question. We are not changing overtime rates or penal rates. That's a Labour lie. And they had to take their, their advertisement off radio yesterday because it's a lie. The plans being made by Ruth Richardson and Treasury hardly featured in National's campaign promises. Yeah, that's my bit. <laughs> Yeah, that's my Treasury officials again prepared a brief for their next Minister of Finance. They recommended shifting health, education and welfare costs onto families and individuals, reducing corporate taxes, cutting benefits and wages and encouraging foreign investment in this country. Then you'll be able Meanwhile, Jim Bolger was promising tougher controls on foreign ownership, abolition of the superannuation surtax, and no cuts in health and education spending. Can you give a cast iron guarantee that they will not be broken, that they will all be implemented? No, we will honour our promises. The policies we thought through very carefully before we put them into our manifesto, they're there to be honoured and to be put in place. The 1990 general election offered New Zealanders a choice between National and Labour, now led by Mike Moore. There was no great enthusiasm. Voter turnout was the lowest ever. As expected, National won a huge majority. But here is uh, Jim Bolger. Look at the media huddle around him. I'm staying well out of that. He's going over to the phone to pick it up. Uh, Mike Moore's been waiting for a while. Thank you, Mike. And, uh... As you say, the, uh, the result has been, um, okay. it's substantial. Mr Speaker, the Government has prepared tomorrow's announcements in view of the disastrous state of the New Zealand economy which we have inherited. Without exception, Order. all the key indicators on economic health are looking bad. Six weeks after the election, the Government announced its first economic package. Sickness benefits for solo parents were cut by 11%. Widows' benefits were cut by 17%. The dole for adults under 25 was cut by 25%. Charges for doctors' visits and medicines were increased. The public health system would be reviewed, education spending was cut, and further reports commissioned. The welfare state was being redesigned. Basically, uh, if you move with enough speed, as they had, uh, for that December 19 package, you can get away with it. But what's very clear, though, is that the December 19 package was written long way before the 1990 election. Too many New Zealanders still float in a dreamtime world that has the good life as a matter of right. Cheap labour would make New Zealand more attractive to international investors. What's good for business is good for New Zealanders. Finally, they've got to have the confidence to invest and to employ. Their bottom lines are being uh, pretty bashed around at the moment, uh, and yet at the end of the day, it's they who will be the ones that prosper from the lower interest rates, from the better employment laws, uh, from a government that's living within their means. We're doing this, finally, for business confidence and for jobs. The new government's first New Year's honours awarded Douglas Myers, chairman of the Business Round Table, a CBE. Roger Douglas was made a Knight Bachelor. I don't believe that there are any perceptible differences. The approach was the same. The uh, key elements were the same. Hijack, ambush, speed before they've got a chance to think, move on to something else, whilst ensuring that the announced package sees completion. The national government completed most asset sales begun by Labour, but retained the Housing Corporation, Electricorp and the railway system. But soon that, including the rail ferries, was sold to an American company and Faye Richwine. We, we as a new government, have these two task forces, one, one looking at uh, you know, foreign investment in New Zealand, are there hurdles, are, are there bureaucratic uh, blockages that we ought not to have, and the other task force is looking at how we can make New Zealand more attractive to international investors by our promotion efforts.
Aotearoa, New Zealand. Behind the veil of South Pacific beauty is an expanding economy, well prepared for the 21st century. Now highly competitive after a decade of reforms, New Zealand invites international partners to share in an exciting business future. Supportive government policies provide a commercially transparent environment with no hidden costs. There are low interest rates and inflation restrained by law. A freely convertible currency with no restrictions on transfers. Equitable taxation without levies on capital gains. New Zealand the profitable partner. By 1993, most banks and insurance companies were owned and controlled overseas. The whole telecommunications sector was in the hands of foreign multinationals. Foreign ownership of manufacturing had increased. The forestry sector was almost entirely controlled by multinationals. Foreign holdings on the New Zealand Stock Exchange had increased from 14% in 1984 to almost 50% by 1992, and the half dozen companies which could have been described as New Zealand multinationals, like Brierley's, Lyon Nathan and Fletcher Challenge, were now classed as foreign owned. Uh, not only, Richard mentioned that you've been strengthened by us joining you, but I think we've been strengthened by having you joining us. And I'm really looking forward to the relationship and uh, welcome to the Irwin family. For ordinary New Zealanders, the possibilities for opposing new right policies seemed exhausted. Demonstrations, petitions, opinion polls were ignored, trade unions had been defeated. Rank and file members of the Labour and National Parties felt they had little influence on their parliamentary leaders. Democratic structures like hospital, harbour and power boards had been abolished. City councils were under pressure to sell off assets and privatise services. Democracy in New Zealand had been limited and redefined. Some individuals in the corporate business sector have been considerably empowered by the events of the last 10 years. But I would guess that 90% of the population of New Zealand uh, has been thoroughly disempowered compared to the influence and effect that they could have on their economy as it impacted on their daily lives uh, in previous decades. I, we ran what was essentially an insulated economy. We did that for very good reasons. It was one of the instruments we used to achieve control over our lives and to achieve the sorts of social ambitions that most New Zealanders wanted. Some of the options we used may or may not be any longer available for one reason or another, but many of them are. We've simply abandoned them for ideological reasons. One of the consequences of that, of course, has been the thorough interpenetration of the New Zealand economy uh, by large transnational corporations. Many New Zealanders will find, as a result of that, of course, uh, that it will become increasingly difficult to achieve their social ambitions because they will have uh, no means of controlling those organisations, and those organisations, of course, have no interest in the social infrastructure of New Zealand. Probably many of their boards of directors are not even entirely sure where New Zealand is, so why should they give diddly squat about it otherwise than as a set of sub-accounts to a large transnational corporation? National lost its huge majority, and the minor parties held four seats and the balance of power. What New Zealand very, very much needs now is stability so that those who are interested in New Zealand, whether they be existing investors or potential investors, do not take fright. That's in everybody's interest, no matter who they voted for across New Zealand today. Next morning, Treasury officials arrived at work early and began shredding documents. They needn't have bothered. Within a few days, the national government had re-established a working majority. For the time being, the interests of international investors and multinational corporations would continue to reshape New Zealand society.
being from a small country which is very committed to multilateralism, uh, we believe in having rules around those areas where the world has to work together. We see rules in world trade, for example. We see rules being developed around climate change. We see rules in health, rules in many areas. But the glaring exception is in the world financial systems. And of course, uh, the whole world is affected when something as central as the American financial system suffers major problems. Uh, the ramifications are felt uh, obviously through Europe, uh, to the south of South Pacific, right through the developing world, China, Japan. It's a worldwide effect. So I think the biggest challenge the world faces uh, this year is how to start thinking about formulating rules uh, for the world's financial systems. Now, the, the question is, who does that? Uh, because while you have uh, many important meetings, whether they're G8 or G20, uh, not everybody obviously is at these tables, only a very small and select group of states are. So such meetings can't take decisions which are going to be binding on people. They, they can't uh, take decisions which have legitimacy. And the next issue is if recommendations from such groupings, like the G20 conference, uh, carry through to, say, the annual IMF uh, meeting, uh, the IMF itself, uh, of course, is not, in today's terms, a, a properly uh, representative uh, body with uh, widespread uh, uh, participation or equal voting shares or proportionately uh, fair voting shares. So the issue of who leads and who sets these rules and what legitimacy they have is, is a huge, huge issue. Uh, the question is, what role does the international system have? What role does the UN have uh, in this? Uh, from the point of view of a small country like New Zealand, we obviously don't sit at a G8, we don't sit at a G20. Uh, yes, we sit at the, the IMF, uh, but we're also mindful of the position of many of the poorest and uh, developing countries who, who don't have voice. So I think through meetings like the one that the Bertelsmann Stiftung is, is uh, supporting this week, we can start to tease out these issues of how to get to make rules which will be considered legitimate and which will have wide buy-in. I think when we're looking for leadership, we're looking for major players uh, to be uh, working closely with each other but of course also consulting with the broader world constituency. Clearly the United States has a tremendous position of leadership, so does Europe. And let's not underestimate the, the powerful mandate Europe has. Europe itself, by coming together, encompassing 27 nations, likely to grow further, uh, with a commitment to a rules-based European Union, has tremendous moral authority when it comes to talking about uh, formulating a rules-based environment. So I think that Europe as a whole uh, can show tremendous leadership. Uh, then there is the significant leadership uh, from China, which must come from India as a mega economy. Uh, and then, of course, the many other significant and large players who are coming together to the G20 meeting. But I'm also hopeful that uh, at, at the UN there will be a role to play because the uh, poorest and most marginalised in particular look to the UN to be a voice for their aspirations and to have a role in the debates which are going on. I think in terms of advocacy for the needs of a wide range of states, the regional organisations which exist around our world are very important. We've spoken in this interview about Europe and its role on behalf of its 27 members, but we also have a very coherent African Union. Uh, we have in Southeast Asia the ASEAN family of nations, which is uh, developing its, its own charter and principles and, and quite a broad-based community, a very ambitious community, is in the making there. Part of the world I come from, the Pacific Island Forum, acts as a voice for uh, largely the microstates of the, of the South Pacific. So in terms of people's voices getting heard, I think up through these regional systems is going to be uh, extremely important. In terms of uh, non-state uh, actors, well, they exist in many forms, whether we're talking uh, the private corporations, uh, whether we're talking uh, the uh, NGOs, of which there are countless tens of 
of thousands, again representing a wide range of interests. But I think when it comes to sorting out rules which are going to in some way bind or guide uh, nation uh, states, then the, the state actors are really where the action has to be. Hello and welcome to Worlds Apart. The UN adopted a series of Millennium Development Goals aiming to make the world a better place by 2015. How close are we to realizing that dream and where do we go from here? Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by Helen Clark, the administrator of the United Nations Development Program. Ms. Clark, thank you very much for your time. I know that you are visiting Moscow uh, to sign an agreement uh, transitioning Russia from a UNDP aid recipient to a donor country, and that's a big deal, obviously, for us. But I wonder how much of this change is a result of UNDP's own efforts and support that it provided to Russia, and how much of it is, you know, Russia's own economic recovery. Russia's largely funded its own development and always has. It's about five years since we actually closed the UNDP country office here. And then we began a discussion with Russia about a new kind of relationship, the kind of relationship we have with other major emerging economies around the world. And that's what led to the signing of the Partnership Framework Agreement. That was in January with the first Deputy Prime Minister. And now I'm back to sign the trust fund arrangement whereby UNDP and Russia will work together in third countries on development. I know that you mentioned the goal of creating a global partnership for development, but like everything else these days, I think development could be an area of geopolitical competition. I mean, we have a number of countries having and funding their own development agencies. There is USAID, there is a BRIC development fund, Gulf countries have their own initiatives. Um, as the top UN official in charge of development, is there a room for competition in this area and how do you make sure that peoples and countries are not exploited because of their vulnerabilities? I don't see it so much as competition. I think from a developing country point of view, having so many more actors in development cooperation is a good thing. can create some coordination problems, of course, but uh, in principle it's a good thing to have new development banks, to have emerging donors, to have uh, a lot of new efforts, so we're all for it. There are a lot of countries sadly mired in conflict. Now, as a development organisation, we, we try to do the best we can in those circumstances. We rely obviously on diplomacy to kick in, the political side of the system and the member states to do their bit. But what we can do is anticipating that there are issues in communities because perhaps some communities feel aggrieved uh, vis-a-vis -vis others. There may be political exclusion of certain groups, social exclusion, economic exclusion. You put those things together, you have the basis for a conflict. So we uh, do try to work on social cohesion, on trying to encourage countries to include people, don't leave people marginalised, don't leave them aggrieved, particularly don't leave the youth out of things. We have a huge youth generation coming through and if the youth are alienated, unemployed, uh, frustrated, it's going to come out in some way. So we work, if you like, on the precursors of what would make for peaceful development. But is it fair to say that that work, at least at the moment, is perhaps not very effective? Because obviously across the Middle East we have lots and lots of very young people who are very dissatisfied. Very frustrated. Uh, is it uh, a matter of uh, perhaps uh, policies not uh, being thought through or perhaps not being uh, implemented? Uh, what do you think is at the core of it? Because you mentioned that you are doing that work, but obviously the results are still not there. Well, we, we I think, can offer good advice. Uh, we can show where things have worked. In the end, governments have got to make the decision to, to take a road that will be very inclusive and bring people together rather than drive them apart. Uh, so we're, we're not always in control of the outcomes. <laughs> in fact, we're not in control of the outcomes if governments decide to take a different path. Well, and it's not always up to the governments in specific countries to decide on that. Uh, let me switch to a sort of uh, uh, less uh, politically charged issue. I would like to go back to the issue of poverty. And uh, when you think about poverty reduction, it's a little bit uh, like a chicken and egg question. Is it? Uh, a policy in itself that leads to poverty reduction or is poverty reduction a consequence of other policies? How do you approach that? Well, it, 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 it's complex, but if you have a growing economy, you do have the chance to 
really target people living in poverty. It won't just happen by itself. You have to have growth which is better quality, more inclusive, more job rich. And then there's the associated issue of inequality. We've seen a lot of countries progress quite fast with people coming out of extreme poverty, but the inequality in the society has grown, and that can also store up problems for the future. Welcome back to World's Apart, we are discussing the empowerment of women with Helen Clark, the administrator of the UN Development Programme. Ms. Clark, if I could shift gears a little bit, you mentioned um, the very high position that you occupied in your native country, being the first elected Prime Minister of New Zealand. You are also the first woman to head the UNDP. Uh, there are some rumors that perhaps uh, you will become the first um, female Secretary um, General of the UN uh, next year. I mean, time will show. but. As far as I understand, it's been an uphill battle, even in New Zealand, which is quite progressive country on uh, gender issues. Do you think you've been, you would have been able to succeed and achieve what you have achieved if you were born to, in the same circumstances, but in a different country? Well, I mean, it, as you say, it was challenging even in New Zealand to break through the glass ceiling, which had stopped women ever getting to the highest positions before. But uh, one doesn't do it on one's own. There's often a strong body of support from women and from many men in the community who want to see women have a fair chance of getting right to the top shots. And I'm happy to say I had very strong support from my family, always from a strong group of friends, and of course from the political party that I was, was part of, and from, from generally women in the community who, who wanted to see women move forward. And I think in any society, you need that kind of coalition of support behind women uh, to take them to the mm. highest places. Well I'll put it to you, we're a small open economy, we have high levels of private sector debt, we, mum and dad have borrowed that debt effectively from foreigners because their local bankers source that from foreigners. Stephen Joyce. Well Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance, I thought the Honourable Member uh, had a better grasp of economics than that. The idea that you could borrow money to invest in the share market and, and raise money is one of those fallacies that most families decide not to do because they realise that actually if you could borrow your way to success we'd have done that in this country a long, long time ago. The question was, all these countries that have a lot of debt, who lends them the money? Well, it's not us. <laughs> We're borrowing. Uh, the money comes from, I mean, it comes out of the financial markets, so it comes from central banks. They lend money, they, you know, they Central banks in Asia are buying our government debt, so we're getting lent money by, you know, maybe the Central Bank of Hong Kong. Uh, so I think the way to think about it is whatever all the mixing and matching through the money markets is, uh, the debt comes from the savings of the wider population. Banks have ended up in the position, as Bernard Hickey has said a time or two on the panel, where they have the franchise on the creation of money and governments put banks in this position and could very easily change the rules. A revolutionary paper by the International Monetary Fund claims that you could eliminate the net public debt, for example, of the United States at a stroke, and by implication do the same for Britain and Germany and Italy and Japan. Joining us is Westpac New Zealand senior economist Michael Gordon. Michael, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. So I suppose at the back of this discussion, is there, is there any real reason we ask why there has to be this deep and fast-flowing river of capital <laughs> flowing out of our economy into the banks uh, across the ditch? What, oh. you've, you've seen, I think, the essential argument, I think we sent you the story out of the Telegraph, which attempts to analyse it, of this interesting paper, and widely discussed, discussed now, out of the International Monetary Fund, about whether we could just essentially you know, flick away all this global debt. Is it possible? Um, I think it's, it's certainly possible to have this kind of arrangement. Um, this, this IMF paper um, is, is really revisiting a plan that was, was really born out of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Um, it does a lot of soul searching about how did we get ourselves into this position in the first place. And uh, I think it's, it's sort of come up again, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, where they are again asking, how did we get ourselves in this position in the first place? Um, I, I mean, I'm certainly not uh, uh, sort of too well versed in the, in the exact details of the plan, but um, I, I guess you can sort of really put it on a, it's, it's on a spectrum of sort of possible 
possible plans of controlling the money supply. Um, really, I mean, money is, it, it doesn't have value in itself, but it's a useful thing. So, it, you know, it is, it is useful to sort of have it in society. Um, but you really need some sort of control on it so you don't have people um, effectively sort of granting themselves more of this um, essentially valueless but still useful product. I don't, um, yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I mean, I don't pretend to understand, and I think the um, the economics editor of The Telegraph is in a similar position, mm -hmm. uh, their entire suggestion, but essentially, isn't it, Michael, that um, credit cycle trauma caused by private money creation uh, dates deep into history and lies at the root of what they say is necessary to solve the problem, and that's periodic debt jubilees which used to be held throughout history. And in simple terms, what they're saying is that we're in the kind of impasse that has only been solved in the past by a forgiving of debt, a debt jubilee of some sort. Would that sum it up? Um, I think that that's one aspect of it. This, um, the, the plan that the IMF uh, paper was, was looking at was um, effectively more about um, who, I uh, guess, sort of who dictates the overall growth in the money supply. Um, and the, the, there are a range of approaches you can take to this. Uh, you can ultimately, someone's got to be the adult and, and sort of say, you know, establish some discipline about it, uh, which is why, for example, we have independent central banks. So this issue of um, the, the growth in the money supply is, um, doesn't get politicised. Um, and I think we've, we've, we've kind of been through at least a decade or so of uh, a period where um, you know, central banks, while being independent, were, were probably a little bit lax. They, they ran very loose monetary policy. We had very rapid growth in the money supply, um, very rapid growth in asset prices, but they kind of said, well, it's, it's not our problem. We deal with, deal with consumer prices, and I think that's, there's a little bit of soul-searching going on um, all around the world in, in that aspect of it. Um, I guess, I mean, the, the issue about, uh, I guess, the uh, I mean, bank profits, uh, I mean, my, uh, I guess my starting point for that is New Zealand um, still has this imbalance between um, this, between saving and investment here. We're still, um, you know, effectively, um, you know, borrowing a lot more than than, than the nation saves. Um, that you know that gets funded from offshore and and by and large it gets channeled through banks mm -hmm. because they have the name out there and the reputation to uh, you know to raise the money from overseas. And I think uh, I think to some degree bank profits kind of reflect that the, the fact that they have that um, the access to international markets. But the bottom line is. Um, even if that wasn't the case, I think we'd still be paying a lot of money offshore. It would just be less in the form of bank profits and more in the form of interest. Uh, the fundamental problem is, um, is, is, is the fact that we, we have this great need to, or just, I guess great desire to borrow from overseas in the first place. It's, it's the IMF paper, not to get bogged down in it, but one more question on it, sure. uh, is essentially making the point that uh, the control of credit growth would become much more straightforward because banks wouldn't be able, as they are today, to generate their own funding, uh, and which is an extraordinary privilege not enjoyed by any other type of business, says the IMF paper. And banks would become what many erroneously believe them to be today, pure intermediaries that depend on obtaining outside funding before being able to lend. Is there some truth in that? Um, well, I mean, I think the, the, the proposition that banks make money for themselves I don't think is right. Um, ba banks can create money for their customers, not for themselves. Um, there, there's quite an important distinction there. And, you know, uh, people borrow from banks. For, they don't, they, I mean, they don't do it for fun. There's a reason. There's, there's usually some intent, some understanding that it's, um, it's going into some, some productive purpose. Um, but, but, I mean, coming back to the heart of the, uh, the, the IMF paper, the idea, it's really more about... Um, a shift from uh, the, the role of credit creation. It's away from banks, but it's really putting more of the onus onto the state, which is why I mentioned you've got to have someone be the adult and someone to actually say, you know, we are going to limit uh, growth in the money supply to X amount. And Michael, very nice of you to join us on this. Thank you very much. So it's got its gainsayers, but it's also got its supporters. The guy who coined the term quantitative easing, Professor Richard Werner, he says that a switch to state money would have major welfare gains, and he's backed by a few other groups as well. But I think it's regarded at the moment as a fringe paper, but it might not be in a couple of years if nothing else solves the problem. Yeah, probably, but although you don't want to get the state um, too heavily involved in um, monetary systems, if you can avoid it, but you'd still try to have some kind of a free market, free... I think, think most surprised. people would be quite surprised, most lay people uh, were very surprised to learn that the Federal Reserve wasn't in fact part of the American government in any way, shape or form, and was in fact 
a private bank. And uh, I think most people would probably think that the state was already much more involved in these processes, internationally anyway, than, uh, than they are in fact. Yeah. folks let's get right to it so all the attention last couple of weeks has been about sequestration lots of drama this week about drones but that was testimony this week from attorney general eric holder that i thought was stunning and should have been dominating the news cycle for the entire week he was talking about the issue of the big banks and being too big to prosecute check this out I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to um, to prosecute them when we are hit with um, indications that if you do prosecute, if you do bring a criminal charge, uh, it will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. Now, the Department of Justice is supposed to take into account that very issue of what a prosecution could mean for uh, the economy. Senator Elizabeth Warren, of course, who is being, has always been critical of these big banks, uh, she actually had something to say about that. If you're caught with an ounce of cocaine, the chances are good you're going to go to jail. If it happens repeatedly, you may go to jail for the rest of your life. But evidently, if you launder nearly a billion dollars, for drug cartels and violate our international sanctions, your company pays a fine and you go home and sleep in your own bed at night. Every single individual associated with this. And I just, I think that's fundamentally wrong. This is stunning to me. Folks pretty much act like it's no big deal. Too big to jail? It, it's, it's, it's huge. And any newspaper that you looked in, whether it was like a real newspaper or online, just tiny, tiny headlines about this. We had too big to fail a few years ago. Now you're too big to prosecute. Who speaks for the common man? When you lose all of your money, we talk about the big investment banks, we talk about AIG. Who talks, who, who is looking into the interests of your everyday person? George. First of all, he's not Secretary of Treasury. He's Attorney General. His job is to prosecute, not worry about the economy. And That's Congress's the first job is to give him the authority to say, if there are banks who are causing a, a calamity with our economy, you should prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. And now that, you know, if, if they're too big, then, then, then you're the one, the, the federal government keeps approving all these mergers. Break them up. Going all right, break them up and you solve the problem. You know, it goes to show you the kind of mob-like um, clout the banks have over not only the White House but the country. They hold us hostage. They're not lending. They're not helping the credit crisis in this nation. And we're not interested in you going after the banks. We want you to go after those individuals who are corrupt, right. corrupting the system. They're individuals just like everyday Americans who commit crimes. There's a price they must pay. Angela, if you're a banker, you're literally sitting there going, forget a get out of jail free card. This is essentially a don't go to jail free card. To, to, to say that because it might affect the economy, we can't prosecute them. Any, members of, if, Rand, if Senator Rand Paul wanted to talk about the issue of filibuster, how about somebody, Republican or Democrat, immediately introduce a law saying, forget that, give the DOJ all the authority to go after them, and you have got to, if you're the president and this Congress, say these banks must be broken up, reinstate Glass-Steagall, because that is amazing. They can bring this economy to their knees and nobody go to jail. It's a story Bill Black knows well. A scholar, litigator, and regulator, he helped prosecutors convict more than 1,000 crooked bankers during the horrific savings and loan scandals back in the 1980s and 90s. He exposed five United States senators, the so-called Keating Five, who took big campaign contributions from bank executive Charles H. Keating Jr. and then tried to help him hide his crimes from bank examiners. His classic book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, is now available in an updated edition. He holds two academic appointments, one at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and also at the University of Minnesota School of Law. And welcome back. Thank you. In a nutshell, what did the jury decide in Sacramento and why should we care? Well, this is the first time the jury has ever got to hear what actually caused the crisis. And the jury was horrified because it was the lenders who deliberately made massive amounts of fraudulent loans 
and then sold these massive amounts of fraudulent loans through additional frauds to the secondary market and eventually brought down the global financial system. And the testimony that came out in the case is that the agents, the uh, FBI agents and the IRS agents, simply assumed that the banks were the victims and the bankers were the victims and simply assumed that the little people, the mice, uh, were the problem in all of this. So they never even investigated the banks and the bankers. Um, the the, the mice? Yeah, and the saying in the savings and loan debacle is you never wanted to be the guy that was chasing mice while lions roamed the campsite. So the, the mice are these alleged tiny frauds uh, type of thing where they ignore the lions who are the CEOs of the banks and such. And the jury said, no, it's the lions, <laughs> it says, not the mice. Yes. So this is a crisis created by the lenders and the reaction of the U.S. attorney, uh, who's Benjamin Wagner there, was, well, we're not going to be deterred in prosecuting mortgage fraud. Well, we don't want them to be deterred. We want them to prosecute, but prosecute the lions that stop this nonsense. Even Eric Holder never seemed in doubt about who was responsible. I mean, his own words indicate that he knew that guilt lay at the feet of those who run the banks. Here he is being interviewed by NBC's Pete Williams. Mr. Attorney General, what does J.P. Morgan admit that it did wrong in the settlement? Well, it packaged uh, loans that it knew did not pass its own stated due diligence test. We have uh, a whistleblower who indicated that she expressed concerns uh, about what the, the strength of these uh, mortgage-backed securities were, and they put them out there uh, to the market and said that they were perfectly fine when, in fact, um, they were not. So to be clear, you're saying that J.P. Morgan's conduct here contributed to the housing collapse? Not only the conduct of J.P. Morgan, it was the conduct of uh, other banks doing similar kinds of things that led directly to um, the collapse of our economy in 2008 and in 2009. Yet Eric Holder didn't bring one criminal case against any executives in charge of the bank's uh, lending. You've called this the greatest strategic failure in the history of the Department of Justice. Yeah, in baseball terms, um, they're batting zero, zero, zero. But they're not just batting zero, zero, zero. They took called strikes. They never got the bat off their shoulder and even swung. They didn't even try. Do you remember when President Obama told 60 Minutes, I think it was late December of 2011, that some of the most damaging behavior on Wall Street was not illegal? I do. What did you think? I thought that he was wrong, that uh, in fact, if he listened to what the United States of America has demonstrated uh, in court and through investigations, the activity was clearly illegal. It was a violation of a whole series of laws that make it felonies. And these are just the frauds that caused the crisis. In addition to the frauds that caused the crisis, which are massive when we could talk about, we have the largest cartel in world history. This was the bid rigging of LIBOR, uh, which is an international standard that sets the prices on over $300 trillion in contracts. A trillion is a thousand billion. Right? And then we have the foreclosure frauds where we have false affidavits over 100,000 felonies in that context. And then we have the bid rigging on uh, bond prices um, where all the major banks, according to the Justice Department, were involved. And then we had the Federal Housing Finance Administration, uh, a federal agency, suing virtually every large of the largest 20 banks in the United States of America, saying they defrauded Fannie and Freddie through false sales, and it goes on and on. Savings and loan debacle, we made over 30,000 criminal referrals. Here, zero criminal referrals as far as we can get any public information. So the first thing holders should have done is reestablish the criminal referral process because, you know, banks don't make criminal referrals against their own CEOs. Do you tell yourself, well, there is a justifiable and understandable reason why they don't prosecute? 
<laughs> no, there is no justifiable reason. Apparently, modern financial regulators are vastly more sophisticated than we were as financial regulators uh, 25 years ago because we had never figured out that the key to financial stability was leaving felons in charge of the largest financial institutions <laughs> in the world. But they do claim with a straight face that they can't prosecute. They make it sound like the only choice we have is to prosecute banks as opposed to bankers. And that's nuts, right? We've always prosecuted bankers. We prosecuted over, uh, successfully over a thousand bankers uh, in the savings and loan and bank right. crises. And those are just the major cases and such. And it, it, of course, it greatly enhanced financial stability instead of the other way around. Indeed, none of the people in that era came back in this crisis and were able to lead frauds, and they couldn't because they had criminal records. The wonderful thing about fraud is that it produces guaranteed record profits. So the person at the top sets a tone that is corrupt, and he creates financial incentive structures, where if you cheat, you make a lot of money. And if you don't cheat, not only do you not make a lot of money, you get in trouble. You get in trouble in the sense that you don't get your bonus because you're not producing the income, but worse, far more powerful, you keep your peers, your friends in the organization from getting their bonus. The people who have the greatest moral backbone leave, and the folks that stay become ever more used to an environment in which cheating is the norm. Pretty soon they almost always start joking about it. They tell these people that are prospering by cheating that they're geniuses, that they're transcendent. It's like the ubermensch, you know, transcends normal human morality because they're better and brighter than all of us. It's Darwinian, social Darwinian thought taken to the absolute max, and it degrades everything. Money is one of the most ingenious inventions of mankind. Most people would like to have more, because we can exchange money for almost everything. Money is good for economic growth and enables us to make useful investments. We have experience with natural growth. At first it develops quickly, then slows down and eventually stops. We also understand linear growth. In that case, the economy grows by equal absolute amounts. Money is covered by economic performance, measured as gross domestic product. But financial assets grow faster than the real economy. One reason for this is interest payments and the reinvestment of these gains, the so-called compound interest effect. At an interest rate of 3.5%, all financial assets double every 20 years at 7% every 10 years. For example, growth in Germany began in 1948 with the introduction of the D-Mark. Financial assets have since grown exponentially. The money is no longer underpinned through real productive capacity. After 60 years in 2008, a crash occurs. The flaw is hidden right in the system. The next crisis is inevitable. But how does interest get paid? Most people believe that only those who take out a loan from a bank pay interest. They don't realize that the interest any producer of goods pays to the bank, for example on loans for the purchase of machinery, is always calculated into the price of the product. In this way, interest is contained in every calculation and is part of every price even in the price we pay for milk, bread, and eggs. 
On average, the price of drinking and wastewater includes 15% interest. Rents, in most cases, include more than 50% cost of capital. On average, at least 30% of all expenditures goes towards interest payments. But who profits from interest? Anybody who saves or invests money receives interest, or to be more specific, a premium for foregoing their liquidity. These interest payments reflect the operating costs of the bank, an adjustment for inflation, a risk premium, and an incentive for the savings account holders for making their money available. Every investor is happy about earning interest. If the interest earned is higher than his expenses for interest, he has made money. But what about expenses through the hidden interest costs? Let's look at the German population grouped into 10 equal parts. 80% pay more interest than what they earn through investments, savings or insurances. For another 10%, interest payments and earnings even out. No more than 10% actually make a profit. If we just look at the difference, we realize how the middle class bears most of the interest payments. Only the richest 10% of the population benefit. They receive about 60% of all interest payments, passive income that is not the result of work. The monetary system leads to systematic redistribution from the majority of the population to the wealthy minority. The major share of the interest burden is carried by the middle class. And banks profit from everybody's debt. Their goal is to use money to make more money. In 2011, the total value of all goods and services worldwide was 70 trillion US dollars. But the stock market had an additional turnover of 63 trillion, the derivative market approximately 708 trillion, and the currency market 1,007 trillion dollars. The financial markets are many times larger than their basis, which is the world's gross domestic product. Further consequences of the flaw in our monetary system are inflation continually growing debt, and the unrelenting drive for growth. Our monetary system, of course, is not based on natural laws, but has been invented by human beings. Therefore, we can also redesign our monetary system without compound interest and the need for continual growth, and without the redistribution of money in favor of the wealthy. The important question remains, can this be achieved? And if so, how? here with John Fullerton, the founder and president of the Capital Institute. It's a new institution designed to explore the relationship between sustainable economics and the financial system. Thanks for joining us, John. Pleasure to be here. So tell me a little bit, what inspired you? What, what brought your energies to bear to create the Capital Institute? Well, Rob, I, as you know, I left uh, J.P. Morgan back in 2001 and uh, began exploring uh, through my own investment activity how to align capital with, a, um, uh, with social and, and ecological uh, outcomes. And, uh, and in that way, um, I really discovered the ecological crisis in a way that I hadn't appreciated before. And through a series of years and, and a lot of reading, um, I learned what many social or many physical scientists have been saying for a long time, which is a very simple observation, which is that a 
uh, perpetually growing uh, economic system is at some point in conflict with a finite biosphere. And as I began to think about that observation, uh, it struck me to have extremely profound conclusions for, uh, for our lives as well as for how finance works. And that really led to the creation of Capital Institute, really to explore the implications of that observation. So you found that uh, your current finance was aligned with an ecology that was uh, headed towards the cliffs. Yeah, I, well, I, I, learned, um, I learned that a lot of what we practice in finance through no ill intents, this is unrelated to the financial crisis and the, the ethical challenges of the financial system, but that the system itself is designed uh, to propel growth in the economic system uh, with no regard to the physical boundaries of, of the planet and with little regard to the social um, uh, criteria or social constraints of, of, uh, of human well-being. And so um, uh, it struck me that a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the symptoms that we talk about, climate change being obviously on the top of everyone's agenda, but ecosystem uh, degradation, soil degradation, biodiversity loss, all of these issues are symptoms of an economic system that is essentially bumping into the boundaries of the, uh, of the biosphere. And if you think about finance and even our money system, which is built on uh, a money system that is created through uh, expanding money through that has interest associated. So as the money supply grows, the, um, uh, the requirement to service money grows at a compound rate. Uh, that forces at a systemic level the economy to continue growing which if the economy is linked to material throughput eventually creates this, this conflict with the boundaries of the biosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a very um, sort of profound realization and uh, what I've discovered is that there are in an increasing amount of people thinking about this question but, but it's very much outside the conventional halls of, of economics mm -hmm. and, uh, and very much new economic thinking. We've been telling you a decent amount about TPP, right? So that's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a trade deal that uh, gives away a lot of our sovereignty. Now that's super relevant because corporations say, hey, if you try to regulate me, whether I'm putting toxic uh, material in the air, the water, as an example, um, you're preventing my future profits so I get to sue you in an international court and stop your ability to protect your community. It's amazing. It's an amazing giveaway of democracy. Okay? So whatever else you might like or dislike in the trade deal, on that alone there's no way you can do it. But TPP is not the only trade deal they're working on. They're also working on uh, TISA, which is Trade and Services Agreement. Now, in there is a provision that uh, revolves around the banks. So uh, this is thrown in there uh, to protect them. Now, listen carefully. I'm going to tell you what's in there, and then we will analyze what it means. They say here in Public Services International Report, the standstill clause would lock in current levels of services liberalization in each country, effectively banning any moves from a market-based to a state-based provision of public services. This clause would prohibit the creation of public monopolies in sectors that are currently open to private sector competition. So hold, I'm going to explain what that means. That sounds complicated, but there's a simple explanation. They continue. Similarly, the ratchet clause uh, would automatically lock in any futures action taking to liberalize services in a given country. If a government did decide to privatize a public service, that government would be unable to return to a public model at a later date. Now, this is not strictly for the banks. I'll give you an example that is not about the banks. For example, some countries have tried to turn water and some even electricity into private hands. This is a, it used to be a public utility in that country and they would they privatize it. Now, we nearly had riots and revolutions based on this because then companies would start charging exorbitant rates for water and local people couldn't afford it. If you're poor, water's not an option for you. <laughs> you can't. It would rain and the company would say that that is my rain, my water, I have the rights to it. You're not allowed to collect that water and drink it for free. Unbelievable. Now what this would do is, if you ever privatized anything like water, electricity, etc., sorry, you're locked in forever. Okay. You cannot then make it public utility again. Now, why the banks? Why is this most relevant to them? Well, 
some places like Iceland, after the bank crash, nationalized their banks. Now that was the right strategy because it wound up leading to a great economic recovery in the long term. And right now they have one of the healthiest economies in Europe. And it's, it wasn't meant to keep the banks national forever. It wasn't they weren't changing their uh, form of of uh, the market economy that they had. All they were doing was, hey, these banks are in a lot of trouble. We're going to rescue them, but when we do, we should get the profits back uh, because we're the ones putting the money in. And once they are stabilized, we will privatize them again, which is exactly what happened. Now, this would prevent that. You're never allowed to nationalize the banks. They're private. They cannot go back to being public ever. So, if there's another crash, sorry, uh, you're going to have to pay all my bills. Uh, you can't. Then, if you rescue me, you can't expect a profit back like any regular investor would, because that you would be publicizing the banks. You would be making them public, and then that is not allowed according to this new trade agreement. Now, that's a pretty big deal. If you lock that into place, that gives them an enormous and completely unfair advantage and might screw over the local populations in any country, whether it's Bolivia, it's Argentina, or here in the United States. So they've got to, of course, keep a secret. Here's another provision we found out about. On June 3, 2015, WikiLeaks released 17 key documents related to TISA, which is considered perhaps the most important of the three deals being negotiated for fast-track trade authority. The documents were supposed to remain classified for five years after being signed, displaying a level of secrecy that outstrips even the TPP's four-year classification. So this is so important and so dangerous that the public is not allowed to know it about it when they are negotiating it. Of course, we only know because of the leaks, right? Thank God for those. That we're supposed to be in a democracy. But our government is giving away our democracy to multinational corporations, and we're not supposed to find out about it, and people who tell us about it get punished in a so-called democracy. Right? And then afterwards, you're still not supposed to find out about it for five years as it's in place. Gee, I wonder why they want it to be secret. Now, if, it, if it was lovely and it was great for the American people and the people across the world, wouldn't you want them to know, hey, look at this great trade agreement we did. Look at all the wonderful benefits it has for you. Because the benefits are pretty wonderful, but they're for the multinational corporations that are negotiating. It's amazing, isn't it? They can find out anything about the deal. They oftentimes write the deal. So the multinational corporations have the right to make these laws to supersede American law, and the American people do not have the right to find out about it. Now, who do you think has more rights? The Supreme Court said that corporations are human beings and have all of the constitutional rights of human beings. They said they are people according to law. Okay. Now they also have extra rights. They have the right to, uh, to come up with new laws and make sure you don't find out about it. And the whole point of a corporation was limited liability in the first place. That's also extra rights that a human being doesn't have. So the people that set up a corporation oftentimes can't get sued because of that limited liability. Extra rights. We have created, these are legal fictions. They didn't exist in the world. It wasn't like, oh, back in the day when we came out of Africa, there was the lions, the gorillas, and the corporations. No, corporations are legal fictions. We created them. They, they are machines built for a purpose. The purpose initially was just limited liability. They didn't have all those other rights. Now they have run amok. They've taken over the government. They are robots that have not, we have not built any morality code into. They're not built to be immoral. They're not built to be moral. They're built to be amoral. Their only objective, according to their code, which we wrote originally, is to maximize profits. And here they have done what a robot does. They have decided, if I take over a government by bribing legally, if I change the laws to be able to legally bribe the politicians, who also then nominate Supreme Court justices, I can buy the whole government. If I buy the government, I could rewrite the laws so I'm in charge and that government is not in charge. And the people, <laughs> we care about them least of all. They're in our way as we maximize profits. We have built robots, they have taken over, and now they're about to destroy our laws and our democracy. That is why we objected to these trade agreements. And of course, everybody in the establishment that is funded by those robots 
fighting tooth and nail to make sure that this happens. There are some progressives and some conservatives who are principled who are fighting against it, but the establishment of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, of course, uh, primarily Barack Obama, the guy who promised this change, uh, is doing the exact opposite. They are fighting on behalf of multinational corporations that have funded their campaigns for time immemorial. So Barack Obama works for them, Mitch McConnell works for them, John Boehner works for them. They don't work for us. And they're trying to steal our democracy in the middle of the night while we're not looking, while we're not allowed to look. That's what these trade agreements are about. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. There's been a, de a debate about what to do about banks that are too big to fail, too big to prosecute, too big to regulate. And the debate goes that the big banks should be broken up, or some people are suggesting the only real solution is public banking, banks that are big of scale and have public interest mandates, publicly owned. And now weighing in on this debate and joining us in the studio is Michael Hudson. Michael was a Wall Street financial analyst and is now a distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. His recent books are The Bubble and Beyond and Finance Capitalism and Its Discontents. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. So what's your take? Break up the banks versus public banking? Well, for one thing, in your very first question, you left out the point that Elizabeth Warren has made earlier this week. Too big to fail means too big to jail. Yeah, and, I uh, said too big to prosecute, but yeah. Prosecute, okay, too big to jail. Uh, when you had the uh, head of the Justice Department uh, uh, for Finance last week saying, well, we can't prosecute the banks because if we did, uh, they already are in so insolvent that uh, we'd essentially have to take over the banks. And if we find them, they wouldn't have any reserves left and we'd have to uh, make them into public banks. And that would be socialism. Uh, well, the fact is that uh, 200 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution was taking off, all of the bank reformers in England, in France, the San Simonians, in Germany, they all believed that uh, industrial capitalism was going to develop banking, and instead of banking being predatory, as it had been for thousands of years, instead of banks lending against real estate and assets and foreclosing and putting people in uh, debtor's prisons, for the first time in history, banks were going to begin to make loans to actually create new means of production, to create industry, to finance factories and equipment that weren't already there. And this is what happened in Germany. It's what happened in Central Europe uh, with the Reichsbank. Uh, leading up to World War I, you had the German banks working with the German government, almost as semi-public entities, uh, along with the military and industrial complex, to be sure. But you had banking taking industrial uh, form. World War I changed everything. Uh, you had uh, a reversion to the English, Dutch, American kind of banking that was called merchant banking. The uh, banks would make loans to ship uh, uh, goods that are already uh, produced, or they'd make loans against real estate. So today, you have bank, 80 percent of bank loans in America and England and Scandinavia are all loans for real estate. So essentially, the function of the financial sector has been simply to load down the economy with debt without helping the economy grow. What you really want is for banks, instead of loading the economy down with debt, to be able to finance economic growth. Uh, instead of just eating into growth as an overhead. Well, uh, suppose that the government were to do uh, what Sheila Baer, head of the uh, uh, FDIC, recommended uh, the, her agency do in 2008 when Citibank went under Bank of America. She said, look, uh, we, we're in the business of taking over banks. Uh, it's uh, not really socialism, it's uh, what the, we do when a bank is insolvent, the government takes it over. Now imagine what America government, uh, the public sector could have done with uh, Citibank and Bank of America. These were the two largest mortgage holders in America. Uh, what actually happened was that President Obama said, gee, I hope the banks write down the mortgages to what uh, people can afford so that we can take off again. Instead, Citibank, Bank of America that bought Countrywide Financial, refused to write the loans down. And uh, so what you have now is uh, 10 million Americans 
in the foreclosure process are already losing their homes. What you're having is the banks having a predatory uh, process, and uh, all, all of a sudden the banks uh, are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Now, is, is, isn't this an, like an inevitable? What I mean by that is if you go back to the early 20th century, and where banks start to play this role of lending money to create re new means of production, and it's a massive need for this with big industrialization, yeah. with tens of thousands of workers in one factory. They need large amounts of capital. As banks become more and more uh, powerful, don't they then find that it starts becoming more profitable, manipulating the stock market, uh, speculating, and you get uh, this whole period up to the 2930 crash, where you have so much banking is, is parasitical. And, th and then the whole thing replays itself out again, over and over again. But isn't it inherent that as long as you have private banking so powerful, it will be also parasitical? This is uh, the key word that you just said is private banking, yes. The, so if the government would have taken over Citibank, it would not have done the kind of things that Citibank did. Uh, the government would not have uh, used uh, its uh, depositors' money and borrowed money to gamble with. It wouldn't have done casino capitalism. It wouldn't have played the derivatives market. It wouldn't have made corporate takeover loans. Suppose the government uh, ran a bank. It would make loans for long-term purposes to serve the economy and help the economy grow, which is what governments are supposed to do. That's not what banks are supposed to do. Banks are supposed to make money, and unfortunately, they can make money most easily, as you point out, by being parasitic, not by being productive. So if you want banking to play the productive role of financing, all of the, uh, financing infrastructure, of financing growth, then uh, it, the only way of doing this is for the government to run the banks. Uh, they've, uh, so, some recognition of this has come uh, by uh, real estate lobbyists, mainly from Wall Street, saying, ah, we need a public-private uh, partnership. Uh, the partnership is uh, where the private sector basically will screw the public sector. And they make the profit, the yeah. public side can take the risk. All, all yeah. the loss. So yeah. that, that won't work. A public-private uh, partnership really means you're leaving banking in the hands of the private sector. And uh, the last time that was tried was in the educational loan system, where the government underwrote all of the education loans uh, uh, made by the banks. And uh, you see the problem now with the defaults there. You would find that in a vaster scale. Uh, the problem is that infrastructure shouldn't be funded by banking. If you fund road building and uh, uh, other uh, bridge uh, fixing up uh, with uh, a private partnership, then you're going to have to charge uh, money for the bridges, you're going to have to charge money for the roads, you're going to turn America's roads into toll roads, you'll turn the bridges into toll bridges, and all of a sudden you're going to increase the cost of living, increase the cost of doing business, all to squeeze out the money for the people who run the toll booths to these roads to pay the banks for the money they borrow to buy the privatization of the roads, and uh, you're, it, you're going to end up looking like England looked up after Margaret Thatcher and uh, uh, her Labor Party and to, uh, Tony Blair. You're going, uh, the financialization of the economy is going to end up cannibalizing the industrial sector, and that's already happened. So instead of uh, what textbooks describe is industrial capitalism of uh, the cartoons where the banker will give money to uh, uh, the industrialist to uh, build a factory and happy workers are coming in, uh, you're, you're, the banker gives money to the corporate raider who buys the factory that's already there, fires, lays off half the labor force, works the remainder more uh, 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 deep, deeply, uh, takes the pension fund for himself, replaces it with a defined uh, contribution program instead of defined benefit, so all you know is what you, is docked from your paycheck every month, not what comes out. Uh, and uh, the role of uh, private banking is predatory finance, takeover loans, shrinking employment, worse working conditions, and they call that rising uh, wealth creation because uh, the wealth is being sucked up to the top, and when uh, they talk about wealth creation, they mean wealth for the 1%, not uh, prosperity for the 99 And the rest of the economy gets paralyzed. So as long as, as, long as that kind of finance is 
uh, left in private hands, you're going to have austerity in America ending up looking like Greece and Ireland. Uh, and the, imagine how different it would have been if the government would have taken over Citibank and the big banks and said, okay, we're going to make loans now and extend credit uh, to our own economy to build bridges and roads like they do right. in China, for instance. Uh, uh, and we don't have to charge interest. We're providing the credit for it. Right. Uh, we don't have to pay executive uh, salaries. We don't have to make finance into the ripoff system it's right. become. Thanks very much for joining us, Michael. Silvio Gazelle was an unconventional economist who sought to know the true nature of money. He was born in 1862 in Germany. At the age of 24, he moved to Argentina and became successful as an entrepreneur. At that time, the economic policies of South American countries were in total chaos. Argentina experienced inflation and deflation repeatedly. Accordingly, the way of life in Argentina was about to break down. Gazelle thought that a currency system and social order were deeply interrelated. Gazelle moved to Switzerland in 1900. During World War I, he published a book entitled The Natural Economic Order, in which he criticized the existing political parties, saying that they only asserted empty ideologies and did not have any concrete economic principles. Gazelle then proposed his new concept of free money. Later, economist John Maynard Keynes stated in his The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money that he believes that the future will learn more from the spirit of Gazelle than from that of Marx. Tyrol, Austria. The influence of the Great Depression, which began in 1929, cast its shadow over the district. In the 1930s, by the brave decision of the mayor of Virgil, a town located close to the German border, Gazelle's theory of free money was put into action. Even though Virgil had prospered because of its transfer station for Switzerland, Vienna, and Germany, the Great Depression brought serious recession to this small Austrian town. Production became stagnant, and unemployed people were found everywhere. The population of Virgo at that time was a little less than 5,000, while the number of unemployed reached over 400. Income from taxes dropped sharply, and the town's debt grew. Virgo was facing financial ruin. Rikal Unten Guggenberger, the mayor at that time, attributed the economic breakdown to the stagnation of money. Currency was saved and not circulated. If money does not circulate, the number of unemployed will increase, production will decrease, and consumption will slow down. To improve the situation, the mayor decided to introduce Gazelle's idea of free money. In July 1932, with the agreement of the Municipal Assembly, the town decided to issue local currency, which was only valid in that town. This action started new businesses, created work for the unemployed, and paid money with the new local currency called labor certificates. The town constructed roads and public institutions and made payments to the unemployed using the local currency. A miracle happened. The local currency, which was initially paid as salaries, rapidly started to circulate throughout the town. By circulating, money performs economic activities several times larger than its value. The town's income from taxes, which had been stagnant, started to increase steadily. The secret of rapid circulation lay in stamps pasted on the reverse side of the bills. At the beginning of every month, a consumer had to purchase a stamp costing 1% of the face value of the bill and paste it to the bill. In other words, the value of the money decreased if it was not used. Accordingly, those who possessed this bill had to use this money first. In this way, these labor certificates started to circulate one after another. The money now had the function of promoting economic activities. This money, created by Gazelle, was epic-making, since it decreased in value as time went by. The money was never saved, but continuously circulated.
This local money was paid as salaries to public servants and gradually became accepted by banks. Hi, you're listening to the YouTube edition of In Context. This is Ken McDermott Rowe. And this is Gus Cantavero. Today we're going to be talking about public banking. The idea is pretty simple. States will use their own funds as the reserve to create a new bank. And the bank that's owned by the state will make loans to promote infrastructure growth and business development within their own states. And it's very important business to get into for the states because during this terrible economic recession we're in, it's all about cut, cut, cut. And we need to think of creatively about new ways to grow our economy. And this seems to be a good way to do that. How is this different than what the banks already do? There's almost only one state in the country, the Bank of North Dakota, in, uh, which has been involved in state banking since 1919 that has such an institution. Mm -hmm. And it's operated very successfully there as for almost a century. And uh, in North Dakota, it's important to note that they have a very uh, low unemployment rate and that they uh, a budget which is one of the few state budgets which is in balance. So it's worked very effectively there for a century. And the tradition actually goes back to colonial times of state-owned banks, back to Pennsylvania. They had a state-owned bank, and it was uh, championed by Benjamin Franklin, who attributed Pennsylvania's prosperity in the 18th century to the fact that Pennsylvania issued its own loans to create business development in that uh, commonwealth. This is my that can be loaned to uh, commercial banks that will then take that money and lend it at a reasonable interest rate to the citizens of the state to fund projects like infrastructure or it could be done for many different purposes and it can be done in many different ways the state bank could loan money directly for infrastructure pro uh, projects or in the case of North Dakota often enters partnerships with other banks mm -hmm. uh, for, for large projects or for emergency loans or for, in some cases, student loans. It would all depend on the priorities of the state. Personally, I think that the main use of such a bank right now would be for infrastructure to promote the uh, economic productivity of a given state, and also for small business loans for businesses that are cut off from private uh, lending right now. All right, and this is something that is a nonpartisan issue. This isn't something that we're advocating to benefit the bankers, because this money would produce uh, future revenues that would then be paid back to the state. A uh, very good point, Gus. These uh, bank loans made by the state bank will produce revenues from interest collected, even though the interest will be at a pretty reasonable rate compared to the private sector. Right. And those in that income from interest will go right into the state treasury. So what is the relationship between the commercial banks that citizens can go up and interact with and get loans from to put their deposits into with a state-run bank? Well, in the case of North Dakota, they didn't really go in big time into the savings accounts, the checking accounts. They see the, themselves as a catalyst for the private sector acting in partnership with other banks to make loans. State bank could have its own savings accounts and checking accounts, but it seems to me that's a need that's already been met by the commercial banks. Where well, we really have the need for state finance banks is for projects that are so long-term that the private sector wouldn't find a sufficient short-term return for them to get into it. <laughs> Additionally, the uh, state-owned bank w would obviously not be paying huge bonuses to uh, high-flying, risk-taking executives. The guys would be paid who work there would be paid reasonable salaries, and they wouldn't be charging exorbitant interest rates because the state could obviously set the interest rate that it, which it just chose to lend money. Beside North Dakota, which already has this bank functioning, aren't there other states around the country that uh, currently have bills pending to uh, create a state-run bank? That's right. There are seven states that have now are considering bills to either create a state bank or to study the feasibility of creating a state bank, including uh, Michigan, Massachusetts, Illinois, Virginia, and Oregon. So it's a substantial movement, and it behind it now, or helping to foster it, is a new organization called the Public Banking Institute, which is chaired by Ellen Brown who wrote a book called Web of Debt, and she's one of the leading money experts in America, and she's decided to put her knowledge of money to work to create this a new state banking movement. So to summarize, a commercial bank will lend money out at a high interest rate and, and earn a profit on that, which benefits them as a corporation, but a, a state-run bank would be taking the interest rate, which is much more moderate, uh, and then putting that money back into the state coffers, which they can create more public service projects or reduce taxes or, or do whatever else that would benefit the citizens of that state. Exactly, Guts, and it's really a no-brainer. Not only that, but the states are investing their money into banks in other states or in other, other locales 
that is not benefiting the state in any way, any shape the, the or form. Big, the biggest form of investments now are derivatives, and they're doing nothing for your local local state development. Well, one of the problems that's hitting the economy right now is that we've seen a lot of the states and cities invest their money into funds that have been completely pilfered by by the uh, the economic crisis right now, causing all the layoffs and budget cuts. And as a state agency, the state bank will be subject to the scrutiny of the elected representatives. So there's going to be accountability. Do you think that the op opponents of the public banking might say that this is going to put the government in a position where they can choose the winners and losers in the economy? I think there has to be a concern that you want the bank to be run on a very business-like uh, basis, and I think that this banking community can be brought to, to understand that this will benefit them, too. If a state economy is increased in prosperity because of investment in infrastructure, that's going to be a boost to businesses of all kinds. Thanks very much for listening to this YouTube edition of In Context. This is Ken McDermott Rowe. And Gus Cantavera. I think the debate that positive money has started is an incredibly important one. As various banking scandals have highlighted, we all need to better understand the role that money and its creation plays in our economy so we can better hold those with responsibilities to full account. You rightly point out how removing the power to create money from the banks would end the instability that's caused when banks create far too much money in a short period of time. And crucially, it would also ensure that newly created money, money is spent into the economy so that it can reduce the overall debt burden of the public, rather than being lent into existence, as happens today. So I especially welcome the emphasis that positive money puts on governments using newly created money to deliver wider policy goals, through, for example, increasing spending, paying down the national debt, or replacing taxation revenue in order to reduce taxes. The case I want to make today is that one of the most efficient and productive ways of spending that money into the economy is precisely in investing in the kinds of policies that are associated with what we've called the Green New Deal. In other words, insulating all of our homes, properly uh, investing in renewable energies, really building a green economy. And not only would that be one of the fastest, most effective ways of getting people back into jobs and therefore their taxes back into the revenue as well, it would also help that other forgotten crisis, also beginning with an E, not the economic crisis, but the environmental crisis. The combination of peak oil, severe weather events, and a U.S. dollar meltdown will force a dramatic restructuring of the way we live as economic incentives shift from global to local supply chains and from suburban sprawl to compact communities. The communities that f will fare best are likely to be those that act now to rebuild local supply chains with particular emphasis on becoming substantially self-reliant in energy and food. The imperative thus becomes an opportunity to rebuild functioning communities, restore a sense of place, democratize economic power, and radically revise our priorities for the use of labor, land, and other natural resources to give priority to life values over financial values. Consider this extraordinarily radical idea. Forget about growing the economy. Concentrate on growing strong and healthy children, families, communities, and natural systems, and prosperity, security, and meaning will surely follow. This is a defining moment. We face an unprecedented choice. Give up the reckless ways of our species' adolescence and accept responsibility for one another and the planet, or continue on a path to collective suicide. In its profound wisdom, the spiritual force of creation is calling us to take the step to a new level of species maturity. Kia ora, good evening. The Greens are calling on the government to act to ease the pressure on manufacturers and exporters caused by the high New Zealand dollar. They say our trading partners are manipulating their currencies to protect manufacturers. Well, the national government here does nothing. Emma Jolliffe reports. 
40,000 jobs have been lost in New Zealand's manufacturing sector in the four years to June. The International Monetary Fund estimates our dollars overvalued by 15%, and the Greens say it's time the government intervened to bring it down. They want the Reserve Bank to expand the currency supply or, in old terms, print money. Money to buy assets. We're proposing that the assets they should purchase are earthquake recovery bonds issued by central government, which means the government has to borrow less from overseas, which reduces the pressure on the New Zealand dollar. Also to invest in the Natural Disaster Fund. But the government says printing money would lift the cost of living for all New Zealanders. All that would do is make the international market look at New Zealand and say, no, you're losing the plot. Uh, and what we really need to do is just continue to work hard to grow the New Zealand economy. But economist Ganesh Nana agrees the government needs to act. It's a market failure that we've got a New Zealand dollar that is just so inappropriate for the New Zealand export sector. It's a bit tough for some exporters, but it's actually a vote of confidence in the New Zealand economy. Every cent of the New Zealand dollar uh, calculation affects our bottom line by $150,000 a month. Nana says China, the US, Europe, the UK and Japan are all manipulating their currencies to their benefit. We in little old New Zealand are left high and dry trying to abide by a textbook that's now way out of date. Labor says the Reserve Bank should focus less on inflation and more on the exchange rate. The National Party are ignoring international trends and we're losing jobs in New Zealand as a consequence. The downside of printing money is of course inflation, but Ganesh Nana describes inflation as yesterday's problem and says we're facing a much scarier problem, the prospect of deflation. Emma Jolliffe, 3 News. The Prime Minister lost use of one of his favourite political weapons today thanks to a policy U-turn by the Greens over printing money to improve the exchange rate. Political editor Patrick Gower explains. Russell Norman takes the bus to work, but today he backed up the bus big time, ditching his idea of printing money to bring down the overvalued Kiwi dollar. In politics, that's what's called a U-turn. It shows that we have the ability to listen, and I think that that's what New Zealanders expect from their politicians. But it's clear the Greens also got sick of listening to its loudest critic. John Key attacks the idea on a daily basis. It's his favourite way of undermining the economic credibility of a Labour-Green partnership. Um, which would be printing a lot of money. Why don't we just print lots of money? I mean, you know, now that they want to print money. It looks like you've been bullied by John Key. Well, Paddy, I mean, I, I think I can stand here with my hand on my heart and say, of all the politicians in New Zealand, I'm probably one of the ones that stands up to John Key day in and day out and takes him on. And Key will just keep on coming. And even if the Greens today are telling New Zealanders that they're not uh, going to print money, they'll be dreaming up some other wacky and crazy idea that no, and it's quantitative easing. It's been done by some of the world's big economies, although Norman could get no political support whatsoever here. Well, we never agreed with that. But Norman is still keen on being finance minister in a Labour Green government. Well, we shall see. It's um, All the portfolios are on the table. And David Shearer really doesn't like the thought of that. If it's a Labour-led government, it will be a Labour finance minister. The Greens had no other choice. It was this simple, suck up an embarrassing U-turn now or give Key a free pass to attack a Labour-Greens alliance right up until election day. Patrick Gow, 3 News. So Auckland's housing crisis, plummeting dairy prices and a report card from the OECD that says we've got plenty to work on. It all sounds a little bit doom and gloom for our economy. Uh, one expert uh, once described New Zealand, as you would know, it's been quoted so many times as having a rock star economy. Is that still the case? HSBC Chief Economist, uh, Australia and New Zealand, Paul Bloxham, the man responsible for that phrase, joins me now. Paul, good morning to you. Thanks for joining us at your very early hour. Good morning. How are you? Very well, thanks. All right, let's look. Let's let's walk ourselves through some of these things. Most important thing is, do you still believe New Zealand right now today has a rock star economy? We do. We we think New Zealand still is a rock star economy. You are still outperforming most of the developed world, and that's really what we meant by that phrase in the first place. Growth is running at about three percent. That's still rapid growth relative to the rest of the developed world. You are one of the fastest growing economies in in, in the developed world at the moment. So yes, we, we we think 2015 has been an encore for the rock star story. Okay. Banks are making millions and millions of dollars out of you.
Figures out today show they've collectively made record profit. All this, remember, just a few years on from the global financial crisis. So how is it they're doing so well? Nadine Chalmers-Ross has been investigating. Exciting news. He's dead! The bank made a record profit! Chances are most people don't react the way the cooperative bank thinks its customers should when it makes a record profit. Yeah. Look at the interest they give on your money, it's pretty poor. I think they're ripping us off as well. I think the profit should be turned back into the community. I'm inclined to boycott banks altogether. The latest KPMG report shows our banks collectively made almost $4.3 billion in the year to April. That's up 22% on the previous year. Not a bad margin, only six years on from the darkest days of the global financial crisis. The New Zealand banks were not savaged and didn't suffer the effects of the GFC and so they have strong balance sheets and as the New Zealand economy has picked up and grown, those strongly structured banks have done very well as a result of that. But the future may not be so rosy as the restrictions on low deposit mortgages bite and lending slows down. There's no doubt the banks make big profits but here are some other big numbers to consider. They collectively employ 26,000 New Zealanders and pay $1.5 billion in tax. And the banks argue KiwiSaver means Kiwis win when they do. All of the KiwiSaver funds as far as I'm aware have exposure to for example the large Australian banks. And what that means is when they do make a profit, those, uh, those funds go through those KiwiSaver accounts. Something to keep in mind, but perhaps still not enough to provoke to this bank. reaction. To the bank. And the banks next report a record profit. So how do the banks make their money? I've been crunching some numbers and here is a very basic explanation. Banks make about 25% of their money from moving money around and charging fees like account fees and automatic payment fees. 75% of their money is made from borrowing and lending money out. So if you put $100 in, the banks contribute, say, $10 of their own money and hold that money or capital in reserve. They then lend the $100 out, charging, say, $7.25 in interest. They pay you $5 for lending it to them, giving on average a margin of $2.25, that's after tax, $1.62 profit on the $10 they put in. But if the borrower fails to pay their $7.25 in interest, the bank's income disappears, but it still has to pay you your $5. So in this extreme example, if that continues for a couple of years, it doesn't take long to eat up the bank's $10 of capital and the bank becomes insolvent which is a brief explanation of why it's so important for the banks to remain profitable. New Zealand First MP Asanate Lolly Taylor says comments she made about the New Zealand Reserve Bank being run by overseas bankers were a joke. 
Asanate Loli Taylor is a prolific user of social media, but her latest comments have landed her in hot water. She said New Zealand should have ownership over the Reserve Bank, and our own Reserve Bank is run by overseas bankers. But now Loli Taylor says she didn't necessarily mean it. Now we're allowed to have some kind of sense of humour when we're actually responding, just saying, oh, come on, you know. So it was a joke? Well, of course, you, you have to have a good sense of humour, otherwise you're not going to last in this place. Asanate says she stands by her point that she thinks there are many overseas people running the New Zealand Reserve Bank. Well, it's an extraordinary organisation. It's, uh, it's 250 people and its responsibilities are probably, I think, broader than any other central bank in the world, um, with the possible exception of the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Bank of Israel. I mean, we really do have uh, responsibility for monetary policy, uh, for financial policy, macro-financial policy as, as well, uh, all the intervention policy, oversight of the payment system, uh, the registration of the insurance sector and the oversight of that, same for non-bank deposit takers. Uh, we also uh, have control of the, uh, of the coinage uh, and serving the, the public's needs. So we're very much a full-service central bank uh, and just 250 colleagues uh, in the organisation doing this is, uh, is an immense set of responsibilities. The Reserve Bank has policy departments and operational departments. So the policy departments are the economics departments, the financial markets departments, the macro financial departments, and um, my department, which is prudential supervision. And supporting those, there's a number of operational departments, um, of which the one that most people have heard of is the currency um, issuance department. So I'm from the economics department, and uh, the overall the uh, purpose of the department is to provide monetary policy advice to the Governor. And we, we do this, we, we split the department into four teams of about oh, six to ten people in each team. Um, and, and they kind of go from a spectrum, from the forecasting team through to um, our research team. So the, the forecasting team is very much our conjunctural analysis and, and trying to, I guess, provide the forecasts and, and the analysis that, that go onto the monetary policy statement. And the, the, the actual lead authors of the monetary policy statement. And then there's the, the, the issues in the international team. Uh, they write many of the governor's speeches and, and they also uh, assess what's happening uh, out in the world. Uh, then, then we have some of our more I guess, technical teams. So we have the, the modelling team which uh, maintains our macroeconomic models. Um, and then right at the end of the spectrum is our research team. And they, they do quite, uh, uh, I guess, long-term research. Um, that often has the ultimate aim of uh, academic publication. Financial markets acts essentially as the engine room of the bank. It looks after the bank's balance sheet, its assets and liabilities. What that means is a big part of financial market operations is managing the bank's foreign reserves. That's the assets that we hold in reserve in a whole bunch of foreign currencies. Part of that is looking after New Zealand's domestic markets and liquidity and open market operations. Part of that is financial markets research where we collate information from the market and use it in, in managing those activities. Part of it is uh, a risk unit, so a big part of what we do is looking at um, credit risks, looking at counterparty risks, looking at market um, instrument risks. We also have an Auckland office that involves all parts of those units as well. So the macrofinancial department uh, is really there, I guess, to look at the risks facing New Zealand's financial system and to uh, give some uh, steer to the bank as to what might be needed to be done about those risks from a policy perspective. 
We're also looking at the overall efficiency of the system, how well is it doing its job in channeling credit uh, to New Zealanders. I'm responsible for prudential supervision and um, that's the department that basically looks at the whole financial system, so banks, um, insurance companies and also finance companies, building societies and credit unions. And what we do is we um, set minimum standards for those and we monitor them. So the idea is to make sure that the risk of them failing is reasonably low. People coming into their careers at the early stages have an opportunity to contribute uh, actively to policy debate. They have an uh, opportunity to be, to be in front of the governors, uh, making a contribution virtually from as soon as they're, they're on board. Um, I remember after an, an appearance at Parliament at the Foreign and, Ex and Expenditure Committee, um, which, which can be a pretty high pressured place, but, but at the end of it, a, um, a, a very experienced, high-ranking high politician came up to myself and the, the assistant governor, and he said this, this great term. He said, uh, "The Reserve Bank really turns up," which is which is a really nice way of saying that um, of all the places that turn up to Parliament and, and, and give advice, you can always trust the, the bank to have done the work really to a high standard. A great Reserve Bank person. Um needs to be able to work with a, um, a huge range of people and needs to have excellent communication skills. So both oral and written communication skills are something we attach a lot of importance to in the Reserve Bank. Well, to be honest, we're looking for people who, uh, who, are, who are smart, uh, clearly intelligent, um, who thrive on challenges, who are curious, uh, and who care deeply about the sorts of problems uh, that New Zealand faces. Quite early on in the year, you send in your application. Uh, then if you get through on that, uh, the interviewers will come and visit you. And if you make it past that interview, which is um, probably to get a feel for your personality, make sure you fit in, then you come in for a, a much more rigorous second round. I read a lot about the graduate profiles online, and I read a lot about what the bank actually did. So part of that was reading the monetary policy statement to get a good sort of overview of the economy, and also the financial stability report. They fly you up, and there's a taxi driver waiting with your name on it, and, <laughs> and then you go stay in a um, place just up on the terrace, and then it's a half-day interview process here. And then you get told, <laughs> I guess. Um, I'm waiting for that. It can be quite nerve-wracking. On my first day, my first assignment was to write a cabinet paper, so that's written under the name of the Minister of Finance, and it goes over and he presents it to cabinet, so it was a pretty big deal to sort of have this as my initial project, but obviously I got a lot of assistance with it, and my buddy at the bank who was assigned to me helped me out a lot, as well as my manager, so I got a lot of help with it, but it was definitely a real eye-opener that they do get you started on real work from the beginning. So the bank's just started a mentoring program, so it's, um, it's targeted for women early in their careers and they're, so they've paired us up with um, a senior staff member. That's what I think the bank does so well is it devises, because there isn't a fixed graduate program necessarily, it will develop your skills and develop you in a way that you want to be developed. So recently I went to London for a week-long course at the Bank of England um, with about 23 other central bankers from around the world. I started in the research team and I'd been in the team for six months and they sent me to Amsterdam to do a course on macroeconomic modelling, which was really exciting. People on the outside might get an impression that we're some sort of ivory tower of knowledge, uh, but actually people are really, really friendly. What I can't get over is just how good the recruitment process has been for finding me friends because the other grads are just amazing people. We have a lot of fun together, we have a lot of dinner parties, we see quite a bit of each other so it's actually worked out really well because a lot of them weren't from Wellington as well so no one really had their fixed group of friends here. One of the things about working here is that you have a really good idea of where you fit in in terms of contributing to New Zealand's economic landscape. So I know that I provide advice on financial markets, which the governor takes really seriously when he considers what to do with interest rates that affect the entirety of New Zealand. We are quite innovative in our policy approaches and I really think there is such a satisfaction about working here and feeling like you are 
but in the forefront of central bank practice of thinking and also of that development in the economy. Think seriously about joining us. We'd love to have you. We, we, need, uh, we need the talents that you bring, uh, your background, your insights, your creativity. Uh, I think you'd love, love working in this place. Uh, it offers enormous opportunity for you and uh, we'd very much like to have you. Uh, apart from the 2% of, of coins and notes that are within our money supply, yeah. um, we do agree that, uh, that what makes up the other 98% ori all originates as interest bearing debt owed to private lending institutions? No. You don't, you don't agree? But I put it to you, we're a small open economy. We have high levels of private sector debt. We, Mum and Dad have borrowed that debt effectively from foreigners because their local bankers source okay. that from foreigners. The Revenue Minister says New Zealand isn't a tax haven for wealthy foreigners, despite a 60 Minutes report showing wealthy foreigners dodging inland revenue by using trusts here. While some might call it tax evasion, Peter Dunn describes it as, in his words, legitimate tax avoidance, and the Prime Minister backs him. Here's Patrick Gower. Inland revenue, also known as the tax man, has always claimed it's our job to be fair. But now the Revenue Minister says when it comes to wealthy foreigners funnelling money here to avoid paying tax, that's, well, fair enough. I think the, ta the term tax haven is a gross exaggeration because it implies illegality, it implies tax evasion rather than legitimate tax avoidance. Yes, Peter Dunn said, quote, legitimate tax avoidance, even though the Inland Revenue website says tax avoidance is wrong and the average taxpayer on the street says Dunn is wrong too. Do you think there's such a thing as legitimate tax avoidance? No. Is that fair? No, definitely not. Yeah. I mean, we every day citizens have to pay it, students have to pay it, so I think everyone should have to pay it. I'm actually not smart enough to do tax evasion. <laughs> I wouldn't even know how. The government's desire for a tax take saw it introduced what it's been dubbed the paperboy tax this year, but on this avoidance issue, the Prime Minister says Dunn has got it right. But he'll be using the absolutely correct technical term. So there are two two things that are talked about in tax law, going back to my days when I studied at university, tax evasion and tax avoidance. Well, there's actually quite a legitimate business in New Zealand for servicing foreign trusts. Keith says under the law, tax evasion is illegal. But tax avoidance is not. The Prime Minister's telling ordinary taxpayers that they're there to pay all the taxes, they're to pay for the schools and hospitals, and billionaires and the ultra-rich don't have to pay tax. Look, tax avoidance, tax evasion, it's basically the same thing. There are three million New Zealanders paying income tax. Peter Dunn wasn't commenting further today, so we asked Inland Revenue for a list of legitimate tax avoidance measures like those used by foreign trusts. As yet... No concrete answers. Patrick Gow, 3 News. New Zealand has already agreed to these changes. Adopting the International Finance Agreements Amendment Bill simply puts that agreement into practice. The bill also creates a regulation-making power in the Principal Act so that further updates to the articles can be made by regulation. This power will simplify the process by which New Zealand meets its obligations. Once changes to the articles are agreed to by the requisite majority of members to the IMF, New Zealand will be bound by the amendments, which means that we are required to bring our domestic legislation into line with our international obligations. The decision to approve changes to the Articles of Agreement at the IFIs is effectively made at the time that the Minister of Finance votes on the matter as a Governor of the institutions. The uh, furthermore, the regulation-making power would not be unique. The Legislative Advisory Committee guidelines note that a number of Acts have future-proofing clauses that allow the Executive, rather than the Parliament, to update the text of a treaty. And in the context of the IMF, this is, uh, there is likely in the future to be further changes uh, in their processes reflecting the changing economic significance of different members. 
These changes do not mean we will change the way in which we consult on important IMF policy changes. Rather, this bill is about demonstrating our commitment to multilateral natural action, as well as simplifying the processes needed to update our own legislation to reflect what has already been agreed to with the IMF. Mr Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable David Parker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I uh, rise to speak to this bill on behalf of the Labor Party. Uh, the Labor Party will be supporting this bill to the Select Committee. The Labor Party supports the function of the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and broadly agrees with the Minister of Finance that these are good institutions uh, that assist the conduct of international uh, economic affairs in a way that benefits New Zealand as well as other countries. Mr Speaker, uh, the, um, the issue as to whether in future amendments to the International Finance Agreements Act should be by way of statutory regulation is, in my view, an important one. At the moment, the, the uh, the executive is required to come before Parliament and explain a change to these international agreements. That's the effect of the legislation as it currently sits. And indeed, the Minister of Finance has done that today. That's as it should be, because these things have uh, financial implications for New Zealand that are important. And I don't agree that we should be creating a regulation-making power so that this is something that is done by the Executive without further recourse to Parliament. Of course the Executive has to, uh, to um, uh, authorise the, the uh, Minister of Finance or his delegate to go along to International Monetary Fund meetings and make provisional agreements in respect of changes to the IMF rules. The IMF uh, rules don't take effect immediately because the IMF rules contemplate that Ministers like our Minister of Finance have to come back and get approval from their legislatures. And that's actually why it is that this change to the International Monetary Fund rules didn't take place immediately upon those meetings back in 2008 and 2010, because there had to be sufficient number of companies ratified the agreement in principle that had been reached at those IMF meetings. The fact that we're one of the last countries in the, in the world to do that, they're already up over 85%, so these changes are already um, been given effect to at the International Monetary Fund, that uh, is because this, the government's been slow in putting this on the order paper, doesn't mean to say that it ought not to be on the order paper. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, uh, agreements such as this, I think New Zealanders will have more confidence in our participation in these international fora if they think governments are being transparent about changes to those international agreements uh, and the effect of those changes on New Zealand. I think we breed suspicion, and there's already enough suspicion out there as to the effect of international agreements. We breed further suspicion if we're not open and transparent about changes to those rules. So for those reasons, amongst others, the Labour Party opposes future changes to this legislation by being by way of statutory regulation making power that this amendment act creates, we believe that uh, future amendments ought to come back to this parliament. If we look back in the history, this hasn't, uh, hasn't been an onerous task for New Zealand to amend this legislation through uh, annual amendments or anything like that. It, it is relatively rare that we have amendments uh, to this International Finance Agreements Act, which dates back to 1975. So, Mr Speaker, whilst the Labour Party approves of the change which uh, decreases the total percentage of, or the percentage of New Zealand of this greater pool, uh, increases the size of the pool um, overall, but then says that the, the individual contributions uh, uh, are pro rata decreased so that the overall effective cost to the country is about the same, we think it is a wise change. I would also note, uh, I don't want to think that people should overstate some of the changes that are being made to IMF voting rights. I'm uh, informed that for amendments, 85% of the votes of members are required, or votes plus ratification by those members subsequently. Uh, the US still effectively holds a veto right because they've got 16% of the votes. So uh, we shouldn't overstate the, uh, the uh, 
the, the changes in that regard. Mr Speaker, uh, we oppose the future changes by may, being made by way of regulation, but support this bill to select committee. The Honourable Fulgoff. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, Labor is supporting uh, this uh, legislation. It's supporting it because we are a member of the International Monetary Fund and we are therefore obliged uh, to meet the obligations that we have in that regard. And the importance of this fund is such that uh, this bill means that it slightly increases our commitment to underwrite uh, uh, an amount uh, effectively to around about $3 billion. It's a significant uh, <laughs> underwriting for a country of our size. Uh, we are not so happy about the changes that allow future updates to the articles to be made by regulation. Uh, we don't think uh, that is appropriate because it means decisions will then be made by the Minister without reference to a debate in this chamber. But I want to go back to a couple of points uh, that are absolutely incorrect that were made by the Honourable Nick Smith. Uh, the accusation uh, that the opposition parties, including Labour, is anti-global. I want to say to the Honourable Nick Smith that it was this Labour government that negotiated a free trade agreement with China. Well and I want to say quite proudly that after I signed that agreement in the Great Hall of the People in April 2008, our trade in four years has doubled with China and that trade has moved more into balance with our exports to China going up faster than our imports to that country. And this national government would be in real trouble if we didn't have a free trade agreement with China that enabled us to have as our second biggest trading partner today a country that is enjoying 10% growth a year. And I want to say additionally that it was this Labor government that negotiated the free trade agreement with Australia and ASEAN, which is one of the most uh, the fastest growing economic regions of the world. It was this Labor government that started the free trade negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So Nick Smith needs to look at his conscience when he makes rubbish statements like the Labor Party opposition is anti-global. This is a party in government that has expanded our horizons and opened up our markets. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. Could you color SVT? Okay, new year later. Um, hello, I'm Kodra Akolor from a Swedish Television. I'm wondering, can the ECB ever run out of money? Well, <laughs> technically, no. Uh, we are. We, we don't. Uh, we, we don't. We cannot run out of money. Um, so we we have ample resources for coping with uh, with all um, with all our emergencies. So I think this is the the only answer I, I can give you. Thank you. Philip Plickert, FAZ. 
Um, I was wondering, you know the question I asked? Mm -hmm. uh, was it a strange or stupid question? No, I think it was a question um, nobody dares to ask, mm -hmm. I suppose, but everyone kind of would like to know. I mean, it's an obvious question. They, they cannot run out of money, but... Um, Greenspan was inscrutable whenever Congress asked about interest rates. He resorted to an indecipherable Delphic dialect known as Fed speak. I would, I would engage in some form of uh, syntax destruction, which <laughs> sounded as though syntax I were answering the question, but in fact had not. We showed him a tape of him at a hearing. Modest preemptive actions can obviate the need of more drastic actions at a later date, and that could destabilize the economy. Very profound. Very profound. It Impenetrably profound. In and so you, did, you worked on these, right? Oh, of course. You worked on making it even more. But what would often happen is you'd get two newspapers with opposing headlines coming out of the same hearing. I succeeded. I succeeded. You mentioned uh, financial regulatory reform. Uh, one of the things that President Obama is pushing for is regulation of derivatives. And also with a thing called the Volcker Rule, he's trying to separate uh, commercial banking interests from investment banking interests. These were uh, things that were the opposite policies of Treasury Secretary Rubin uh, and Summers at the time. Do you think, in retrospect, they gave you bad advice on those issues? Well, I think... Uh on the derivatives, on the, on the, before the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed, it had been breached. There was already a total merger, practically, of commercial and investment banking. And really the main thing that the Glass-Steagall Act did was to give us some power to regulate it, when uh, the repeal, and also to give old-fashioned uh, traditional banks in all over America the right to take an investment interest if they wanted to forestall bankruptcy. Sadly, none of them did that. Mostly it was just the continued blurring of the lines. But uh, only about a third of all the money loaned today is loaned in tr to traditional banking channels, and that was well underway before that legislation was signed. So I don't feel the same way about that. I think what happened was uh, the SEC and the whole regulatory apparatus after I left office was just let go. I think if Arthur Levitt had been on the job at the SEC, my last SEC commissioner, an enormous percentage of what we've been through in the last uh, eight or nine years would not have happened. I feel very strongly about it. I think it's important to have vigorous oversight. Now, on derivatives, yeah, I think they were wrong and I think I was wrong to take it because the argument on derivatives was that these things are expensive and sophisticated and only a handful of investors will buy them and they don't need any extra protection and any extra transparency. The money they're putting up guarantees them transparency. And the flaw in that argument was that, first of all, sometimes people with a lot of money make stupid decisions and make it without transparency. And secondly, the most important flaw was, even if less than 1% of the total investment community is involved in derivatives exchanges, so much money was involved that if they went bad, they could affect 100% of the investments and indeed 100% of the citizens in countries, not investors. And I was wrong about that. I've said that all along. Now, I think if I had tried to regulate them because the Republicans were in a majority in the Congress, they would have stopped it. But I wish I should have been caught trying. I made, that was a mistake I made. But I put it to you, we're a small open economy, we have high levels of private sector debt. We, Mum and Dad have borrowed that debt effectively from foreigners because their local bankers source okay. that from foreigners. If you take, for instance, um, Lock and Bar, yep, fair enough, um, they, Labor might say that they're opposed and Winston Peters might say it's a deal breaker. But back in 2007, 
uh, Labor under Michael Cullen and David Parker agreed to the sale of Poronui Station. It's right next door to Lock and Bar. It's six and a half thousand hectares. In fact, so proud of the sale were they that Labor actually went out there and asked themselves a parliamentary question, let alone put out a statement going on about what, how magnificent the benefits were. To quote Michael Cullen, which I don't often do, we welcome foreign investment that has real benefits for New Zealand. And then, uh, I might add, by the way, that was in 2007 when Winston Peters was uh, part of that Labor government. So uh, there's, we are, whatever it is, 46 odd days to an election, uh, and I think most New Zealanders will say uh, that uh, some of the stuff will be whipped up and the intensity of it will be whipped up uh, for election reasons rather than what actually re in reality happens in government. So under my government, over the last five or six years, we've sold uh, or allowed the sale of foreign land to foreigners at a much lower rate than Labor did. We actually toughened up the legislation in 2010 and you know we've made stronger <laughs> economic measures as part of the test. So I just think, you know, the opposition parties, particularly Labor and uh, New Zealand First, got to ask the question or answer the question, if it was okay back in 2007, why is it not okay for the station that's right next door today? The point I'd make actually about, about foreign investment is the following. One, whatever the rules are, they have to be consistent. It can't be okay for an American company to buy, or okay for an Australian company to buy, or okay for a German company to buy, uh, or, uh, uh, or entity, and not okay for a Chinese one because there's been plenty of sales of you know, farmland and Southland and other sort of issues uh, which have gone to buyers and, and no one's had anything to say about it. So consistency is, is firstly very important. Secondly, hundreds of thousands of New Zealand jobs are actually underpinned by foreign investment. So James Cameron has come to New Zealand <coughs> and he's bought a number of properties in the wire wrapper. He's also going to produce Avatar 2, 3 and 4 in New Zealand. We know from The Hobbits that 5,000 plus jobs were created as a result of filming The Hobbits in New Zealand. So I didn't see the opposition parties screaming from the rooftops that James Cameron shouldn't be welcome to New Zealand and shouldn't be able to buy those properties. So in the end, you know, I, I just think that we've all got to be a little bit careful in an election period that we don't lose sight of the fact that New Zealand imports a fair bit of capital and needs it. I mean, no OECD country borrows more of its borrowing from foreigners than New Zealand. So if you put a tax on that, you have to get into the definition of what is hot money, what is legitimate investment in New Zealand. Um, you run the risk that you ultimately force up interest rates and that's more ex a more expensive burden on the economy. So you know, I, I don't think that's you know, practically going to work. So we made clear today in the speech the Budget 2011 focus will be on investment and savings. And the reason for that is that if you look at the structural issues that the New Zealand economy faces, those issues are quite clear and apparent and they are an over-reliance on borrowing from foreigners. So no OECD country, no developed country uh, owes more of its debt to foreigners as a percentage of that debt than New Zealand. And that means if those foreigners one day decide that New Zealand isn't as attractive destination to lend money, we could face a real crisis in terms of our ability to fund not only our public sector debt, which comes from government spending, uh, but also private sector debt, which funds your home or business. So that's a situation we can't afford uh, to occur. I think. Uh, 82 countries involved now in the Occupy Wall Street protests, 600 uh, protesters walking up Queen Street, plenty of people in Aotea Square. Yeah. Do you have any sympathy for them? Well, I have sympathy in this regard, and that is that if you go all the way back to what's caused the global financial crisis, you can apportion an enormous amount of the blame at the footsteps of Wall Street. And it ultimately created products that um, destroyed capital around the world and effectively you know, bankrupted the banks around the world. I mean, they sold products that in their heart of hearts they must have known they wouldn't be repaid for. So I can understand that bit. But if you take another step in terms of capitalism and its capacity to lift people out of poverty, well, that is the only way ultimately. And that's why you get a communist country like China, probably the most capitalist society on earth.
And there is such a thing as taking something too far. I guess these people are saying capitalism, maybe it's gone too far. Yeah. Do you have any policies within National to reduce the, the ever-widening gap between rich and poor? Yes, that's another interesting one. I mean, the most recent data we have is the 2010 Ministry of Social Development report, which actually showed that the gap was narrowing. Really? Yep, that's what it showed. Wow. Um, but, but the one thing I'd say is this. I mean, a lot of times people talk about narrowing the gap between mm -hmm. the rich and the poor. Isn't the real argument here about lifting those that are poorer higher in terms of their income and their wealth? But if there is a finite amount of wealth in the world, which sometimes it feels like there is, uh, that's, that has to spread throughout the population. Um, I'm, not, like I'm, if it's, I'm actually if it's not so sure. I'm not so sure it's as simple as that. I mean, because the, the way I look at it is, mm -hmm. let's take someone like Graham Hart. Yeah, he's fabulously wealthy, mm -hmm. um, and he's got lots of money, but he's taken enormous amount of risks and he's done lots of things along the way. Yeah. But whether he's fabulously wealthy or not is not actually the, rele the relevant point. The point is, if somebody else is, is poor, if we can lift them to being a middle-income New Zealander or over time a higher-income New Zealander, that's actually the difference. So it's lifting the base, and that all comes through education. On May 21st, Bill English will deliver his seventh budget. Like the sixth that have preceded it, it will be an important event, a time to take stock on our economy, but also to lay the groundwork for economic growth and opportunities over the next 12 months and beyond. It will be a budget that will include uh, lots of new spending initiatives in areas that will be of great importance to New Zealanders. In areas like health, education, science, research and development and others, the budget will allocate new resources for new programs and new ideas. Our economy is doing well. We're one of the fastest growing economies in the Western world. Unemployment continues to fall. Uh, our wages are rising faster than inflation. And for many New Zealanders, they can see that our economy is in much better shape today than it was seven years ago. Budget days used to be full of lots of surprises and changes. More often than not, booze and cigarette prices going up at night. These days they are a little less exciting, but no less important to the future of our country. We've got a strong, vibrant country that's doing well through the hard work and enterprise of New Zealand businesses and New Zealanders. The government plays an important part in getting the books back in order, making sure that we have a strong foundation for growth and opportunity, and I'm sure Budget 2015 will deliver on the high expectations that New Zealanders set for this government.